I'm Soko Sibia, Senior News Editor of Africa.com, joining you from Johannesburg, South Africa. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to you to Africa's portal to doing business with the United States. This virtual summit is unprecedented in terms of scope and scale. And now I'd like to introduce Teresa Clark, CEO of Africa.com. Teresa, an accomplished businesswoman in her own right, is a former managing director of Goldman Sachs and has served on several corporate boards in Africa and throughout the world. Teresa. Thank you very much, Soku. Well, today's virtual summit is indeed a unique moment in the history of US-African business relations. Never before has a group of such senior government leaders in the US come together to speak to such a large audience of African private sector leaders, large and small. We would like today to thank um, our sponsors. We have a tremendous number of sponsors who have been really helpful without whom this event would not have occurred. We'd like to thank GE, including one of our keynote speakers, Farage Rizoa and Patricia Obuzwa, whom we work with on many occasions. Today, we would like to thank our new relationship with Bank of America, in particular, Yvonne Ike, who has been tremendously helpful in putting together the panel of business leaders from Africa. Thank you very much, Yvonne, for your help with that. We're also very pleased to welcome back Covington, and Covington has um, a fantastic asset in Whitney Schneidman, who will be moderating the panel of the government agencies. So thank you to all three of our sponsors without whom this event would not take place. We have 25,000 registrants from 123 countries across this series of webinars. You come from 46 countries in Africa and 77 countries throughout the rest of the world. We wanna tell you a little bit about who you are in the audience. We have 70% of those in attendance are C-suite or equivalent. We have a large number of academics from Harvard, from Yale, from Oxford, from a number of the universities around the African continent, in particular, the Lagos Business School, Swarthmore Business School, Kenyatta University, Gibbs Business School, Vitz Business School, University of Cape Town. We also have senior government leaders. We have a number of diplomats from across the continent, and we also have very good relations with the president's offices in many African nations who are figuring out how to address COVID-19. Many African countries have specific task forces that have been set up to address COVID-19 within their countries. And we have a very large participation across the board from those particular task forces, typically inside the president's office. We also have a number of NGO heads and members of civil society who are working cooperatively across all sectors in order to achieve the goals that we all hope to achieve today. And that is to find ways to help Africa prosper. On the right side are some of the topics that we've addressed over this series. We have looked at leadership, we've looked at liquidity at a time when liquidity has gone dry. And we've tried in many ways to help the African business community um, access resources and thought processes that contribute to success. And today's event is right in line with that in, in the sense that we are bringing to you another set of resources to help African businesses thrive and survive in this current context. Um, with no further ado, I would like to move right into um, the, the meat of our program today. And we have such esteemed speakers that I, if I were to read their long biographies, they wouldn't have an opportunity to speak. So let me start by addressing the Honorable Tibor Nage, who is an amazing diplomat. He is someone who has 32 years in government experience. He's a retired foreign service officer, including over 20 years of assignments across Africa. He served as the US ambassador to Ethiopia, the US ambassador to Guinea, as well as the deputy chief of mission in Nigeria, Cameroon and Togo. He also has had assignments, including Zambia, the Seychelles, Ethiopia and Washington DC. The Honorable Tibor Nage is the highest ranking government official in the United States related to Africa. As the Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, he oversees all matters Africa related for the US government. We are particularly honored to have you with us today and let me turn it over to you to deliver your remarks. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so, so much. And many thanks to Africa.com for organizing this event today. You have a terrific lineup for the four panels, including key leaders from USAID, Prosper Africa, and the Development Finance Corporation, and five of our most prominent ambassadors in Africa. I think it's an indication of just how seriously we take doing business with Africa. 
Let me share with you why I am back in this job as Assistant Secretary for African Affairs after completing a 32 year career in the Foreign Service 2003. It all comes back to two conversations I had. In 2016, I was asked by then Assistant Secretary Linda Thomas Greenfield to serve as acting ambassador at our embassy in Abuja, Nigeria, a country I had served previously as deputy chief of mission. During that stint in Abuja, I spoke with the governor of Borno State who told me that his state had the highest population growth rate in the country, high unemployment, and the lowest level of educated women and girls. He explained that Africa's, much of Africa's population growth will take place in that belt in Northern Nigeria where opportunities are fewest for African youth and provides a ripe environment for recruitment by extremist groups. My second discussion was with a group of young Nigerians who had participated in the Young African Leaders Initiative Program, Mandela Fellowship. They were some of the sharpest, most astute young people I have engaged with anywhere. And I spent 15 years in academia. To me, they represented the bright future of Africa. These two conversations fueled my desire to return to government. The policy priorities that we have developed in the State Department's Africa Bureau are centered around the theme of looking at Africa through the windshield and not the rear view mirror. That means we are looking for opportunities to engage Africa at all levels for a healthier, prosperous, more secure future. We know that Africa's population will double by 2050 and 70% of these people will be under the age of 30. We can either view what I refer to as the youth tsunami as a force for instability, out migration and potential crisis in Africa or as the greatest force in the 21st century for dynamic economic growth and innovation. Africa is a very different place from when I first went to the continent in 1976 as a first tour officer, and it took three days to book a call back to the US. Now, with the internet, mobile phones, social media, young Africans are as wired and clued in as young people anywhere in the world. They have the same aspirations for a good job, a nice home, a family, and a better future. Young Africans are online and connected with friends and family who have relocated to Europe or the United States. They see what life is like in Paris, London, or Berlin. These are very strong factors that fuel the urge to attempt the dangerous path to migrate to Europe or the Middle East. The key is to create these very same opportunities in Africa so people won't have to leave to have a better life. What Africa needs is real economic growth and development. And in my view, there is not enough development assistance to fuel the kind of economic growth Africa requires. I have seen many models for development assistance during my career. And the one thing they all have in common is that they have all failed and much of Africa is still developing. I firmly believe that jobs and economic growth will come from private sector investment in Africa. The same way private sector investment led to growth in South Korea, China, and other countries that were once considered underdeveloped. That is why the top priority of the Africa Bureau is to promote increased US trade with and investments between the US and Africa. From my first day as Assistant Secretary, I've been working with American business groups to promote inc increased trade and investment on the continent and expose American companies to the tremendous market opportunities in Africa. I have also been working with our embassies in Africa to create better platforms for identifying opportunities for US investors and African investors. We now have something called deal teams at all of our embassies where agencies work together to identify opportunities and partnerships for American and African companies. Later today, you'll hear from several US government officials working on America's renewed focus for promoting trade and investment with Africa, including Tori Whitney, the chief operating officer of Prosper Africa, our new one-stop shop for American businesses seeking to do business with Africa and African companies trying to enter the US market. You may ask, why am I so supportive of US investment? It's because American companies hire and train locally for responsible positions 
transfer technology and skills, empower women, and don't ship rhino horn and elephant tusks back to the US. American companies respect the environment, don't bribe government officials and pay their taxes. American companies are good citizens, but US companies will only invest where there is a level playing field that includes open tenders, low levels of corruption, and a fair and impartial judicial system. In a fair and open process, American companies can compete with anyone and deliver a quality product. A Beninese proverb says, you must attend to your business with the vendor in the market, not the noise of the market. We are ready and willing to be your partners. Thank you very much. We have some questions for you. And one of the questions that we'd like to ask you is how is it that you think that Prosper Africa is going to play in a role going forward in making um, the resources of the US government available to African businesses? Yeah, Prosper Africa is something that I wish we had had 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, you know, we've been insisting and pounding the desks of ministers of trade across Africa for decades, saying that African nations should set up a, a one-stop shop for investment or a, what we call a guichet unique in French. And the uh, little secret was that the United States government not, never had anything like that. So for the first time, uh, we are putting the activities related to promoting business and trade with Africa uh, at all of the various government agencies under one umbrella. And that's why I'm so excited that the, uh, the relatively new CEO will be talking to you all today because there's two sides to this. Uh, one is the American side uh, for American businesses who have never invested in Africa, but desperately would like to. But the other side is, is just as important. It's on the African side and it has the components of working with African businesses who would like to do trade with the United States. But even very important is working with the host governments to advise and work with them to put in place the kind of environment uh, that would be attractive to businesses, especially from the United States and other countries uh, where they really care about things like a rules-based system, uh, you know, uh, corruption-free as much as possible, fair judicial system, because there are always business disputes. So uh, I am tremendously, tremendously excited about uh, Prosper Africa and uh, what it holds for the future of African and U.S. trade. Well, thank you. Now, we've also invited our audience to submit questions, and we received hundreds of questions before this event. Um, there's a question for you uh, that comes from New York from the managing director of a U.S. private equity fund, and I'm going to read that question to you. It says, the U.S. government has accused China of using debt trap diplomacy in Africa. That means making huge loans to African governments that they expect may not be repaid. Then, when the African government defaults, they seize the assets. Zambia is the first African country to announce a coming default. Will U.S. interest in Africa result in the U.S., quote, saving, quote, Africa from having its assets seized by China? Well, <laughs> here's the thing. This goes back to what I said before about uh, looking at Africa through the windshield and not the rearview mirror and, and absolutely treating with our African colleagues as equal partners, uh, you know, without a, you know, a, a, a dispowered relationship. So African governments being sovereign states have absolutely every right to engage in the types of, uh, you know, businesses and business relationships they want to. Uh, you know, I, I don't remember the United States ever holding a gun to anybody's head and saying, you have to take these loans from China or you have to, uh, you know, sign these kind of deals. I think it would be very hard for anybody to explain to U.S. taxpayers that we're going to use your money to, uh, you know, bring out of debt uh, uh, Chinese, uh, you know, loans and that your money is going to end up going back to China. So absolutely, I think uh, the, you know, the G20 is going to be actively working with African governments on how to uh, reduce the debt load. Uh, but at the end of the day, countries are sovereign and they make their own decisions on what they do with their funds and their projects. Well, thank you very much. Well, we will have some more questions for you during the panel Q&A and um, we're going to move on now to Barry. 
Thank you. Um, I'm very happy to introduce Farid Fazoa, who is here today wearing two hats. He is the co-chair of the President's Advisory Council on Doing Business in Africa, an initiative of the U.S. Commerce Department that works in close coordination with the President of the United States. I'm happy to say that I served on that panel, on that council for two years, um, and I know the important work that they do. Farid is also the President and Chief Executive of GE Africa, and this is a role that he comes to um, after having spent a long career at GE, much of which was in the healthcare sector. At this point in time, however, he oversees all of GE's businesses in Sub-Saharan Africa, in the healthcare, power, aviation, and renewable energy sectors. So Farid, I turn it over to you for your remarks. Thanks, Teresa. And uh, once again, thank you uh, to Africa.com, the whole team, for setting up that, uh, that session today, which I'm very honored to be part of with uh, my friend Tibor and, and some others here. Um, I think you've introduced uh, um, me as uh, the leader for GE in, in Africa and also in my quality as co-chair for the US Presidential Advisory Council on doing business in Africa. But I would like to start by, you know, planting the, uh, the, 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 uh, the context, which, you know, the COVID and its implications have shaken not only the world's economy, but, but Africa as well. You know, if I, if I look at the most recent assessment and analysis, and, and one has just been released by the World Bank, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa's economic growth is gonna predict, is predicted to fall uh, close to 3.5% in 2020. You know, it's gonna push the region into the, the first deep recession in the last 25 years. What I've seen in my tenure with GE, I live in, in Johannesburg and I've spent the last uh, eight and so years in Africa, is that over the last 10 years, we've built a very strong momentum uh, around fighting poverty, improving the infrastructure development of the continent. And when you look at what the pandemic is bound to do in the next year and so, it's about to put another 40 million people into extreme poverty in, in Africa. So I don't, I don't mean to be grim, but this is a reality and it's imperative that, you know, African countries, Africa as a continent build resilience to enable faster and stronger inclusive uh, economic recovery, um, but also build the, I would say the partnerships that are needed uh, to enable this recovery. And, with regards to the US-Africa relationship, I would say US-Africa commercial relations, trade relations and partnership is even more critical today. Um, expanding the two-way trade and investment, I think Thibault alluded to what the aspirations of Prosper Africa are, and I'll come back to that a little bit later, um, to ensure economic resiliency and stability on both sides of the Atlantic, because it's a, it's a two-way street, it's a partnership. And if we think about the new normal that you know, would be imposed by the pandemic, it really requires a coordinated, focused effort uh, by the US government, uh, but also by the African countries uh, to foster that, uh, that uh, partnership. So let me give you some background about PAC-DBIA. So as you said, the acronym stands for U.S. Presidential Advisory Council for Doing Business in Africa. Uh, this council was established in 2014. Teresa, you served on this council before, but it's aimed at providing the analysis, but more importantly, recommendations and actions uh, to the President of the United States through the Secretary of Commerce uh, on strengthening the engagement uh, between the United States and Africa. We're now in the third term of the PAC-DBIA, and I would say a lot of recommendations have been built. Uh, some actions have been taken. You've seen some of them over the last few years, uh, including some of the key uh, free trade agreements, for instance, we're seeing with Kenya today uh, being worked out. Um, and uh, going into Prosper Africa and, and really a very ambitious uh, strategic uh, economic initiative to increase the two-way trade and investment. 
we, we wanted PACTVIA to have its feet on the ground and make sure that all the recommendations and actions uh, do not uh, remain dead letter and are being effectively implemented. So in that spirit, our council, very recently, we uh, actually made a report out of the recommendation and actions to Secretary of Commerce Ross, uh, end of July. And we formed six priority issue working groups that are focused on areas which we believe the US government and the private sector uh, from the US and Africa are best situated to advance the mutually beneficial US Africa trade and investment. So I'll go through these areas because Teresa, I think they're very important. One is, is key. Um, it was mentioned um, before by Tibor, but finance and financing is at the heart of uh, any kind of partnership that we could do. And, and the US uh, government and the US private sector has a big role to play here. Second one is technology and digital economy. Uh, third one is public procurement. We insisted on the rules of transparency, the value-based type of um, uh, commerce and trade and investment that you know, is, is very important deep to the heart of the US government, but also to the US sector. Workforce development is critical. Uh, and particularly when we're talking about the implications and aftermath of the pandemic, workforce, all investment in workforce development is gonna be even more critical going forward. Trade facilitation and physical connectivity. And then last but not least, and I think that was a theme that came through uh, in, in some session of Africa.com, uh, it's small and medium-sized enterprises and particularly women entrepreneurs. So with, uh, with these set of actions, we, we really want to make sure we're achieving Prosper Africa's objective, which are truly to modernize and synchronize US government tools and initiatives. And this is something we could do by creating forums where the US government, the African um, um, private sector, the US private sector, as well as the African government can meet. Um, and that, you know, include things like making sure that the, uh, the, the, frame, the framework agreements such as the uh, African continental free trade agreement uh, and some of the bilateral agreements are, are truly uh, taken into consideration when we work out uh, the schemes. Um, we've seen some encouraging steps taken through the Kenya, US-Kenya free trade agreement negotiations as you've seen lately. And we wanna make sure that uh, this is pursued particularly to create the uh, economic resilience and you know, improve the supply chain preparedness, which is key. You know, the second one is, and, and you'll hear about that uh, with the second panel, the, the financing recommendation is really towards creating powerful modernization of the existing tools. Uh, we particularly support the recommendations regarding the Exim Bank, the US Exim Bank, that will re-examine some of its, uh, you know, requirements uh, to make it um, you know, more adapted to today's requirement uh, in terms of both the US private sector and the African partners uh, to really um, carry on some important projects. You'll hear about the Development Finance Corporation, uh, which is, you know, the, the new OPIC, um, together with coordinating US government grant making institutions. You, you've seen some of them, they've been extremely active on the continent, with the FCC, uh, the um, AID, um, we strongly endorse uh, the assessment of creating blended finance solutions uh, by the cooperation of these institutions. Last but not least, I, I talked about uh, small and medium-sized enterprise. This is uh, a key element, the uh, effort of PACDBIA, but also of Prosper Africa is specifically aimed at making sure that it's not only about the, the big corporation that I represent um, on, on both sides in Africa and the US, but it's about you know, creating the conditions and the tools to support SME development between the two countries. You know, I don't know if you know that, but according to a recent study that was led by Power Africa, which is 
you know, an initiative by USAID, women make up 80% of African informal economy, and it, they only participate in the formal economy at the rate of only 30%. So we know that women entrepreneurship is a key driver of uh, a small and medium-sized enterprise in, um, in Africa. And we want to make sure we, we uh, enable the SME development. So, Teresa, I'll just finish on, on a couple of reflections, which is also from, you know, our G Africa uh, experience. Um, how do we build resilience in Africa going forward? Um, one way to do that is, is really to create local supply chains. I've heard through the discussion about the free trade agreements or the free trade area, both on the sides of the African countries, it is key to make sure that we create the ability for US companies uh, and private investors to localize their supply chains. It can only be done if we have a free trade area that enables the scalability of uh, the output. And, and this is something that you know, we've experienced ourselves in GE uh, over the last decade in, in Africa, where we've created opportunities and localized our, our jobs uh, in Africa, but also by localizing our jobs, by localizing some of our activities, we've created a lot of jobs in the supply chain. And I think this must be a, a key priority for US companies operating in Africa. They need to think in terms of localization, localization of their leadership, of their workforce, and also of their supply chain. And that's going to be something that as we go into a more open area, as we learn from what the pandemic has created in limitation of travel, of you know, a, a business continuity, of mobility, of uh, resources and people, I think this is a key element to consider. The other one is, is really committing and remain committed to local hiring and managerial training. Uh, this is something that we've experience that we've applied uh, over the, the, the years in Africa. If I, if I look at my own leadership, you know, all my leadership team in GE across the businesses are local Africans today. It took us more than a decade to build, to create the leadership, to create the resources. And today, I don't need to wait for resources from Europe or the US to go and fix a CT scanner in a hospital that is faced with a pandemic. There is a local African talent and field engineers that can do that in each of these countries. And this is something that, you know, you need to continue apply and looking at what the US government under Prospera Africa is doing right now, or aspire to do, is really to support US companies to do more of that uh, together with their um, African partners. Um, so I would say, in summary, Teresa, it is critical that U.S. and African businesses work in partnership. Um, it is about creating long-term sustainability and resilience. Uh, I think that's the aspiration of Prosper Africa, to make the a sustainable trade investment partnership between the U.S. and African countries um, with localized capabilities um, and establishing local uh, um, capabilities to build quality uh, in the future. Thank you so much, Farid, for your remarks. You sit in a unique vantage point to be able to share your knowledge and expertise um, across both sides of the Atlantic. And so we thank you and we will come back to you with some questions after we hear from our, our next speaker. Sure. Um, I am very, very honored to be able to introduce Yvonne Eich. Um, Yvonne is someone who I have known or known of for much of my professional career. Um, women in banking, um, especially those in Africa, are a very, very uh, in, in short supply. There is an industry that needs to have more women, and you know who the leading women are. Yvonne is on a short list of very significant bankers who have deep experience with over 25 years of experience in the financial services sector. 
um, working across capital markets, fixed income, derivatives, and equity products. Yvonne has led senior teams in New York, Geneva, Hong Kong, Nigeria, and South Africa. And in 2014, she joined Bank of America, and she established Bank of America as a leader in providing international banking services in the sub-Saharan African region. Since Yvonne went to um, Bank of America, she has led the sub-Saharan team to execute over $20 billion worth of transactions for Bank of America's clients. So she is a banker to um, who I have respected and to whom I have looked up for many years, and it's just wonderful that we have her here today to share her perspective. Um, in addition, like all of the leaders we have today, in addition to her business life, Yvonne is very committed on the philanthropic side, is engaged in a number of important um, charitable activities. And in particular, she was tapped by Aleko Dangote to serve on the Dangote Foundation Board, among many other important activities that she does to serve Africa. So with no further ado, I would like to introduce you to a friend and a colleague, um, Yvonne Eich. Teresa, thank you very much for organizing uh, this particularly important summit. I hope that together we will create very historic moments for Africa and US relationships. Uh, Africa.com has done an amazing job over the, the recent times in just bringing important issues to the fore and bringing the right people to talk about them. And as you normally do, Teresa, taking it forward and, and taking making real action out of it is what we admire you for. We also really applaud the thought leadership that's been shown by the US government and US private sector in engaging in this kind of dialogue. And, we, and we're very keen to better understand, and, and we, in this case, I mean Bank of America, but to better understand and work with the US government to help build mutually beneficial bridges between the US and Africa. In the midst of these unprecedented and truly challenging times, we have a unique opportunity to, re, to rethink, retool and act very differently with a sense of urgency on a global level that will ensure progress for mankind. Because that's really where we, where we need to be thinking now. And this will, will require, as Farid said, and as Thibault said, it will require engagement and collaboration in areas of mutual benefit between the developed world and the developing world. And it, it's uh, including, of course, Africa and the United States. We all know that the economic impact in Africa of COVID has been particular, particularly devastating far-reaching and has the, imp the potential to disrupt the growth trajectory of the continent in indescribable ways. I'm going to, as one of the things, one of the simple things I'll, 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 I'll give is just in terms of, I'll speak a lot today about this impact, but not too much about that because we all know about that. I'm gonna focus more on the tools we have to come out of this pandemic and the tools we have to ensure prosperity growth in the continent. And frankly, what I do mean is the lack of tools we have, which is why uh, there is a, an important and symbiotic relationship to be, de to be further developed with the American, uh, American community to, and I would say it's development facilitation that needs to happen here. And, 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 and why does this matter? So in all of this pandemic, the, 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 the developed world has had 12 trillion US dollars as stimulus packages that they've been able to apply to address this pandemic. In Africa, we've had 40 to $50 billion at best. This is, this, and this is in a region that is increasingly relevant and, and, in, and in becoming an integral uh, uh, global part of the global economy. And uh, why, why does this matter? 300 million of the Gen Z uh, community will come from Africa. In the rest of the world, 60, 65 year olds are more than five year olds, except in Africa. As Tibor mentioned earlier, by the turn of the century, 40% of the global comp uh, uh, population will come from Africa. And, and as was mentioned earlier, 40 million people out of the 100 who will go into poverty as a result of this current uh, times we're in will come from Africa. So we have this great, the, the greatest resource, which is the human capital that we have. In addition, across our 54 countries, we represent about 20% of, of, of the global population. 
and a landmass that's larger than US, United States, China, India, Japan, Mexico, to name a few countries. And some of the largest repositories of natural resources in the world, including cobalt, platinum, uh, manganese, uranium, uh, to mention just a few, and of course, oil. Now, why does that matter? What it does mean is if we do not collaborate in a very strategic and different way than we have before, those resources remain underdeveloped. The both the human capital and the natural resources. And we do, we, we, the reason why development facilitation is particularly important is if we consider the liquidity challenges that we face in Africa today. So yes, we have had capital markets that have been increasing over time and Af more African sovereigns and African governments have been able to access capital markets. But we're still talking about a pool of debt capital from these markets that's about $200 billion. If, and if we compare that to say the US that has over three, three, uh, $30 trillion in outstanding, in outstanding debt at this time. And then we look at infrastructure financing, which still, um, the financing gap for each year is about 47 to $87 billion per annum. China and France continue to contribute, a bit, well, between 2014 and 2018, were the top most, in, uh, the top largest investors in Africa with, a, with over $100 million over that period, over $100 billion, forgive me, over that period. So we see that the investment, and then if, if, if we look at sovereign wealth funds, in Africa, we have about 100 billion uh, across nine countries in assets under management in sovereign wealth funds. Compare that to 71 trillion, that's available, or rather 7 trillion rather, that's available in 80 countries around the globe. And then we look at the debt capital that the sovereigns in Africa have today, about 80, 50 billion, 850 billion dollars, of which 300 billion only is in on, on concessional terms against a debt to GDP ratio of about 50 million to 50%. So what does that mean? Large problems for both parts of the world. And, and right now there's a misallocation of the tools to solve those problems. And therefore let, I want to talk about some of the key, ch the key channels and kind of the key uh, areas we need to look at together to fuel prosperity growth, which will be beneficial for Africa and for the United States. If we look at in, in the capital markets, so as I said, the capital markets is viant and has been growing. And if we look at even this year alone, Bank of America has been able to support the Africa Development Bank to raise a social, a, a social bond, which was primarily targeted COVID relief for over 3 billion US dollars. We've also helped other investment grade corporates like Africa Finance Corporation and uh, corporate and, and uh, Helios Towers, amongst others, to raise money in the capital markets in this pandemic. So the markets are available. The problem is the pool is too small. And importantly, at this time, we all need to stand together to push debt restructuring, which is key uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the debt, in, in the capital markets. We need to do more social um, and, and green bonds. Importantly, we need more risk management tools around how these instruments are issued, especially if we're going to accelerate the, 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 the level of issuance while still managing, very importantly, the level of sovereign debt and the, love, the level of debt, uh, debt capacity that each country has. We must, we, we, we need a world where ratings agencies are more reasonable and consistent in their approach in how they deal with African credit issues as opposed to credit issues around the world. We need more sophisticated structures for asset managers and pension funds to invest through. So infrastructure financing is another important, very important aspect of what we need to do. Digitalization of financial services is a must do for development in Africa. We must all focus on financial inclusion. And if we look at some of the, some of the initiatives that have come through um, today in the private sector, and I, I must applaud the private sector for taking some important initiatives in fueling development in Africa. So if we take the, fa the Facebook project of two Africa, where um, to invest in the submarine cables that run across at least 16 African countries, investing billions of dollars, about $5 billion. The economic impact on Africa is over 50 billion US dollars. These are the kind of investments that we applaud, 
and that we encourage the US, in gov US government to encourage, to, to encourage and support more of. We also need to talk about ESG and think about ESG. At Bank of America, we continue to leverage our platform to affect lasting change. Um, we have an Africa recruitment program in job creation where we have over 100 graduates who we employ in investment banking in our offices in, Amer in the United States, in, in London, in Paris, in Dublin, uh, am amongst other places in the world. And we continue to globalize that, that approach of building real financial, financial experts around the world. Healthcare through the Global Fund Education, uh, it, we're, very, we're very active in supporting on the continent and entrepreneurship, supporting entrepreneurship through Acumen, which is a US, um, uh, which is a US entity. It's clear that Africa does need viable and symbi symbiotic relationships to achieve its trans transformation, uh, transformative agenda. There is no question that the architecture of US Africa policy when directed and forced focused is impactful. Some of the policy changes that, are, that we, I would suggest that we consider very seriously, how, ways to increase the funding made available to Africa, particularly with respect to technology and infrastructure. Investment in education and in, and in technology and manufacturing, it would be very important contributions. Africa as a body is beginning to see how to engage on restructuring the global financial infrastructure together with the developed world, working with the World Bank, IMF, who we have to applaud them for what they have done for Africa so far, um, G20 and the UN, to really restructure how the entire global financial architecture works and to, to get a more balanced uh, uh, pl playing platform for different parts of the globe. We're all in this together. Access, one of the important things is we have a large diaspora in Africa. It would be great to work with the African government to find ways for that diaspora to find efficient and reliable ways based on US standards of investing in their money in the continent. Their knowledge and understanding of the risks in the continent are different and they can, they can invest with more, with more confidence. We need to find ways to let them do that. So across the board, I, my, I would end by saying the, uh, the, the U.S. government has done many things to fuel growth, uh, to fuel growth in Africa. I, AGOA created over a million jobs in Africa. The U.S. Millennium Challenge Corporation have been some of the initiatives in the past. We encourage that these, uh, these initiatives are con uh, continue to be um, used. Prosperity Africa is clearly an organization that, is, is, do that is, is doing great things and positioned to do great things to build bridges between Africa and, and the United States. And on behalf of Bank of America, in, the, in any ways that we can support this initiative, we would be, it would be a pleasure and an honor to, to be part of it. Well, we have some time for Q&A. We're going to have to be very efficient. Um, and we're going to have the first question for Yvonne and then for Tibor and then Farid will get the last one. Um, for Yvonne, this is a question that comes from another banker, a banker at Standard Bank in Johannesburg, South Africa. And the question for you is, you were recently quoted in African Banker magazine about the issue of Africa's sovereign debt and the challenges it has in repaying that debt in the current economic crisis. You pointed out that African countries do not have the same access to liquidity as more developed countries. What do you think is a solution for African countries with regard to their current debt, you know, in two minutes or less? <laughs> <laughs> in two minutes or less, um, we, we need to have the same playing field. So I talked about the ratings agencies before. I have to keep stressing that. I do, I do think that we all need to collectively bear on the um, private investor world to restructure the debt this is not about debt forbearance in the in the pub in the capital markets this is more about giving fiscal space for african countries to come uh, to come out of the debts the debt situation and and frankly the the low growth the, the low to depreciating growth situation that we will otherwise face so i would say those two things in in if if you ask me to be very quick about it um but th those would be the two things i say we need we also infrastructure investing 
where we work on increasingly important tools. And I think we'll continue to hear more about that. There are lots of opportunities where, uh, and, and lots of important ideas about how we can give more sophisticated tools that protect investors in the US and, and, and uh, in, in the US and the developed world uh, and still ensure that products in Africa get done. And some of these structures we've used successfully, we've supported successfully in, in Latin America, for example. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and Tibor, you've been very nice to let me call you Tibor, but somehow I feel like I must call you um, Assistant Secretary. So Assistant Secretary. Tibor is great. Okay, Tibor, thank you. Um, question for you, and this comes from an executive at the IFC who sits in um, Dakar, Senegal. And the question for you is that the World Bank doing business 2020 rankings of countries around the world, uh, this is a ranking that looks at the ease of doing business in each country, um, has only two African countries, and they're small countries, in the top 20, uh, Mauritius and Rwanda. Africa's largest economies, Nigeria and South Africa, have low rankings for their ease of doing business. Question for you is, how is US policy for doing business with Africa influenced by these rankings, showing how hard it is to actually do business in Africa? As far as influencing policy, it's not that determinant because, you know, we look at the potential. I mean, the, the two big countries you mentioned, Nigeria, South Africa, the potential there is tremendous. And South Africa already has, uh, you know, hundreds of US companies doing business. Um, that will be one of the key roles for Prosper Africa on the African side of formally engaging our U.S. government representatives on the ground on the continent to work closely with the governments that if they're serious, and, and, and I underline this, if they are serious about wanting to attract more U.S. investment, these are the things that you really need to do to attract more American businesses, especially the, the medium and the, and, and the smaller enterprises. You know, you know, people talk about this training program, that training program, this uh, amount of funding for technical assistance. The, the truth is, honesty in government doesn't cost any money. It, it requires willingness. And, you know, if you have leadership at the top that really promotes a, a rules-based system and a level playing field, you don't need technical assistance to do that. You don't need to tra need, take training courses to do that. It just needs to be an ethos that then will imbue the rest of society because the people look up to their leaders to take their examples. And we know that there is a huge divide between the younger people coming on the scene now with their entrepreneurial spirit. And frankly, some of the people my age who you know, come from a do totally different mindset. And uh, that, that's why you know, I say Africa through the windshield and I have always been and will be an Afro-optimist. Over. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And thank you also for being brief. You, you, you guys are winning prizes in that department. You're very efficient. Um, the, the next question is for Farid. Um, and this comes from a professor at Oxford University at the Said Business School. And the question for you, Farid, is that last week it was announced that GE was awarded a $47 million contract to build power substations in Benin. Congratulations to you for this big news. Um, now the question is, what commitments do you make to the people of Benin for local procurement? What percentage of the contract will actually be spent in Benin? Yeah, no, that's a that's a great question, and actually, it's um, it's linked to this. It's very uh, very timely, I would say, but it's also very relevant to the discussion we're having. Um, you know, this this project actually is the result of uh, a multi-year compact that the MCC has developed. Uh, with Benin over the year, and um, and I, I think we're very glad that we were able, through a transparent process of procurement, to be able to put the value proposition of GE uh, and uh, and being awarded that modernization of the grid uh, system in in Benin. And you know, just like I I made I made it clear in in the things we've learned um, in in Africa and doing business in Africa. It's, it's about making the commitment to first, you know, create jobs, direct jobs, and, and create value add um, to the, the countries and the recipient countries and the host countries. It's about committing to hire 
uh, local people to train them um, to work for GE, but also it's about creating jobs in the supply chain and, it, and it's critical. And if you look at this contract um, of uh, you know, improving the grid system, making distribution of power much more sustainable in the country, we're gonna create you know, immediately 20 jobs, G jobs immediately in this country. And it's gonna create you know, more than 100 jobs in the supply chain uh, only to execute that contract. But what we're looking for, and we've, we've been you know, quite consistent in doing so, is it's probably our first big footprint that we're gonna create in Benin. So we're learning as well. We're working together with the uh, authorities, with the local partners, but our wish is that we create a, a bigger GE in Benin in the long term, making sure that you know, we just don't stop on building substation and then going away. We wanna be part of the modernization of power and, and power infrastructure in the country for the long term. So the jobs we're creating, the people we're training, the infrastructure we're building is something that GE is going to look after for the next, you know, 20, 50, 100 years. We've been 120 years in Africa and we want to be uh, 100 more years in Benin, you know, working on improving uh, the delivery of the power systems. Let's stay with you for a moment, Farid, um, and let's get you another question from another academic. Um, we have a professor at Lagos Business School who asks the question, how does the U.S. compare global opportunities for investment? And how does Africa compare to Asia, India, Latin America, and other emerging markets? It's a great question. And I, and I think it's at the heart of, of, you know, let's be realistic. The, the limitation I've seen and we've seen, and that's something we've debated within PAC-DBIA um, among the members in our bilateral discussions with African countries and multilateral as well. You know, it is critical that what we are anticipating with the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement or the building of what I would call free trade area. Actually, it's not me that called it. I was with, you know, Minister Patel that some of you know in South Africa, who's a brilliant, you know, minister. And he's mentioned the need to create those free trade areas within Africa. And it's critical because what in my view stems the investments versus other parts of the world from US companies or other investors, but particularly uh, companies, industrial groups that need to localize their supply chain, create the market, is the scalability. You know, looking at one country in Africa, although you've got 54, to some extent does not create the right scalability for an industrial group or an investor to really invest to create large scale supply chain versus a big single market in Asia or in some other parts of the world. And I think we, it needs a level of collaboration between the African countries to really harmonize from a regulatory standpoint, from a custom standpoint, from a tax standpoint. If we could start seeing that being a reality, I think it's going to induce much more investment. And to be honest with you, this is the wish I make, because for somebody like me that works in an international company, a uh, multinational, we always have to prove that Africa is a great opportunity versus others in the world, because we compete for dollars, we compete for investments with Asia, with some part of Europe, and it is something that now in Africa, we need to build to really attract more investments. Well, thank you very much for that, Farid. Well, you have been efficient with your time as well. Um, so I'd like to thank all three of you for having participated in this keynote session. This is the part of the, um, this is the part of the virtual summit where if we were live, I would be greeting you on stage at this time and I would be shaking your hand and then I would give you a little box with a pen or, or some other memento. Um, we're not able to do that here, obviously virtually, 
But in that spirit, we would like to thank you for your effort um, on our behalf. And so we will be making a contribution in your name to the Student Sponsorship Program of South Africa as a small gesture to uh, express our appreciation for you sharing your time and expertise with Africa.com and its audience today. So thank you, Tibor Naj, Farid Fazoa, Ivan Eich. We're very grateful for you to having um, shared your knowledge with us today. Thank you. Thanks. The second panel that we have today is called Hear It From The Agency Heads. Now this panel discussion features among others, the head of Prosper Africa, which is a new US government initiative that brings together the resources of over 17 US government agencies to connect US and African businesses with new buyers, suppliers and investment opportunities. And just to provide a little bit of connective tissue between the first two panels here today, um, Farid Fazoa is serving as the chair of the President's Advisory Council on Doing Business in Africa. That is a high level macro advisory group that has been working since 2014 uh, to focus on how to improve business relations between the two countries. And one of the recommendations of that council was to create something like Prosper Africa. Part of the feedback that that council heard consistently in talking to businesses across Africa is that the US government is a very complex organization and people don't know where to start or how to access those resources. So Prosper Africa was born out of that, the need to do that and that recommendation. Um, the purpose again of this panel, as we said, is to now get to the meat of, of, of these, uh, of what we're talking about from a macro perspective. What we're looking to accomplish today in this particular panel is to hear it from the people who make those decisions. We are tremendously fortunate to have the African heads of the major U.S. agencies that provide resources to global businesses. They have all agreed to join us today in order to um, share with you the very specifics of how one accesses those resources. Now, we're not only grateful to have the, uh, the panelists who are joining us um, on this session, but we have just, I couldn't imagine a better moderator. We have Dr. Whitney Schneidman, who is a senior international advisor for Africa for Covington, but that belies um, his true depth of experience. I mean, in addition to that role, uh, Whitney has nearly 40 years of experience working across Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, you just heard from the current um, Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs. Whitney actually served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs in the U.S. government. And he's been on the Africa Advisory Committee of the U.S. Office for the Trade Rep and at the U.S. Export-Import Bank. When we mentioned to all of the African heads of these agencies who would be moderating this panel today, everybody had universal praise uh, for Whitney and just knew that we had someone who is going to ask tough questions and keep them on point because he knows exactly what they do, having worked within several of their entities and working closely with U.S. government for over 40 years, Whitney knows his way around Washington. So um, with no further ado, I would like to turn this over to Whitney to moderate the second panel of today, which is hearing it from the agency heads. Whitney? Uh, Teresa, thanks for that very warm and uh, kind uh, uh, introduction. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, with you and, and with these panelists, there's no question that what you have done over, you know, since the lockdown, the COVID lockdown uh, with Africa.com and bringing so many people together, I think your figure was 25,000 is really quite extraordinary. So hats off to you. And, uh, you know, it's just great to be here um, on this panel. Um, as you intimated, I sort of know everybody on this panel. Uh, I've, I've worked with some, some have worked with me, but, but most importantly, we've been having a long conversation about leveraging the private sector in Africa for accelerated economic development. And I think, you know, tied with that is a conversation about strong U.S.-African relations. So I think this, uh, this, this panel, indeed the whole session today, is um, really reflective of that. So before I jump in, let me just um, introduce my panelists. 
Um, Tori Whitney uh, is the uh, Chief Operating Officer of Prosper Africa. Um, Ramsey Day is the Assistant Administrator for Africa at uh, USAID. Uh, Worku Gachu is the Managing Director for Africa at the US International Development Finance Corporation. Uh, C.D. Glynn is the President of the US Africa Development Foundation. And uh, Brad McKinney is Vice President for Economic Security and Operations. Uh, and he also heads the program on China and transformational exports at the US Export Import Bank. So we have an all-star uh, crew, as, as you uh, uh, said, uh, Teresa. So let's just uh, jump into it. And let me start with you, Tori, because uh, Prosper Africa is sort of the big, uh, the big light of, of, of the Trump administration. And I know you've been working so hard at it. It's an all a government approach. But for our listeners out there, you know, what is, what is the key one or two things they need to know about Prosper Africa and how can they uh, access your resources? And thirdly, what resources do you have to make available to them so they can better their business on the continent? Over to you. <laughs> Thanks, Whitney. It's a pleasure to be here. And I trust you'll let me know if you have any issues hearing me. Um, I appreciate the question, but I also appreciate the contributions you've made to Prosper Africa and really pleased to be joined with so many of my colleagues from across multiple participating Prosper Africa agencies. So it's a, it's a big multifaceted question, but I'll do my best to, to be brief and break it down for the audience. I, I think that the design and the intention of the U.S. government's Prosper Africa initiative has really been long outlined and discussed. So I'm really excited today for the opportunity for myself and my colleagues to focus on the initiative's progress, its impact, and I think most importantly to provide really actionable information, in this case to African businesses, on just precisely how to access the resources of the U.S. government through the administration's new Prosper Africa initiative. I think it's been touched upon, but, but really what's differentiating our approach from previous approaches is that you have 17 U.S. government agencies often challenging to navigate operating as one and in tandem with one another, and that's true operations on the continent as well as in the United States in Washington. And we're bringing all together those services and resources which are unique to each of the different agencies and departments that you'll hear more about today um, in order to help um, in a more efficient and a more focused way than ever before investors and exporters to identify new partners, advance opportunities, and really to close deals. And some of those tools in that toolkit that touches matchmaking, due diligence, financing, advisory services, and much more. Um, and I am really pleased to share that through these efforts in Prosper Africa's very first year, we directly supported more than 280 deals to close. And that was across more than 30 African countries and totaled over $22 billion. And I think for the purposes of our audience today, it's important to note that a lot of those deals that we supported included um, support to small and medium-sized African enterprises. Those SMEs are really the engines of our economies and a real focus of the initiative. Um, Please feel free to interrupt Whitney, but I thought I'd yes. offer one example, um, if time permits. Do you feel it okay. does? Yeah, one example, then I'm gonna to come to you with a question. Good, that sounds good. All right, well, one example, let's take um, uh, Field Intelligence is a healthcare technology company based in Nigeria. And they recently received transaction advisory support from USAID as part of their toolkit to advance Prosper Africa. And they use that to complete a $3.6 million investment round. And they'll use that investment to scale up tech that helps pharmacies inventory, stock high quality medicines, which is particularly relevant in the wake of COVID. So just one example that might resonate with this group. And uh, we'll hand it back over to you, Whitney, for a follow up. Okay, great, Tori. So if, if, if I'm an entrepreneur in Lagos or Mombasa or Kinshasa or Goma or anywhere on the continent, and I need some of your uh, real time information, or I need to get in touch with your uh, toolkit, how do I do it? 
Great question. So I would first encourage that entrepreneur, wherever you are, to get started by going to Prosper Africa's brand new digital resource center. And that's hosted at prosperafrica.dfc.gov, a really good place for someone to start to get a, a, a holistic understanding of what this looks like at large. It's really that one-stop shop for learning about as well as accessing all of the US government's resources that we have to support trade and investment. Um, so you can find the right tool for your specific business need. And through that site, you can actually reach out directly to Prosper Africa team members who will help you and they'll connect you with the right US government representative for follow up across any of those agencies if it's appropriate. But I should note, Whitney, that there's really no wrong place to enter. The whole point of this is not to make it more complicated. So right. whether that entrepreneur were to approach a point of contact at their respective embassy or any agency, you're going to get into the same funnel of that fully orchestrated coordination across the government. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, we'll come back to that. Um, sure. Thanks, Tori. Let me pivot to uh, Worku. Um, it was almost two years ago that Congress uh, passed the BUILD Act, which doubled the size of OPIC uh, and created the U.S. Development Finance Corporation from a $30 billion entity to a $60 billion entity and sort of gave this new organization, the DFC, capability to invest equity in projects. So in that two years, I know you've been quite busy. I think you've hit the ground running, if not sprinting. So can you just sort of give us a flavor of, of what the DSC has done and, and, and what do you see as your signature success uh, in the nearly 24 months since the DFC has been in business? Sure, uh, thanks so much, Whitney. And, and let me start by thanking Teresa and the Africa.com team for, for, for organizing this session. Uh, they've done a tremendous job over the years ensuring that you know Africa uh, gets the attention uh, that it deserves. Uh, but yeah, like you said, you know, we've we've hit the ground running uh, at the DFC. So we've, you know, our new tools uh, and authorities came online um, January of this year, right? And um, from within that time frame, right, you know, spent uh, a lot of kind of thoughtful back of the house work ensuring that our processes were in place to actually utilize these 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 new tools. And then um, beginning in March, we began uh, deploying the new tools. And so, like you mentioned, uh, with the new agency came along our ability to invest uh, equity. Um, we actually um, have now a focus on low income and lower middle income countries, a concentration of whom are on the continent. Um, we also have been given uh, some flexibility with regards to our U.S. nexus, um, and this ensures that, um, you know, uh, if there is a transaction that aligns with our development, our foreign policy, uh, and our commercial return objectives, um, we could support them uh, even though there might be minimal uh, U.S. nexus here, and we think that's important in terms of, of, of driving development. And so, you know, with these new tools, you know, we see it as, as, as a way for us to really double down on the continent. You know, currently we have $8.2 billion invested, and our growth objective is to increase that number 10% year over year for the next five years. And so working with uh, our Prosper Africa colleagues and other colleagues within the interagency, right, I think you see a whole suite of tool here, uh, tools here that, you know, put together can really help drive forward uh, a, a transaction, you know. One thing, since you just spoke about equity, you know what's 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 exciting about the equity product. You know, historically, OPEC um, um, was 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 somewhat reactive. You know, people would come to us with a proposal, with a project, we would evaluate it, say yes or no, and then and then and then move on. Now, you know, um, just given the nature of the financial product, right? Equity allows us to be much more proactive, right? If we hear or come across. Um, a business or an opportunity that, that, that we think aligns with our triple aim goals, right? We can go out there and support them. And so this is, this is an exciting shift in terms of, 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 of how we approach origination. So um, is the DFC open for business in all 54 countries in Africa? We are, we are open for uh, um, business in all countries uh, except for one. Um, and so uh, 
uh, and we are, you know, very much sector agnostic, right? I think I think recognizing that you know uh, there are many sectors that will uh, achieve the kindness development goals, right? Um, we are we are quite open in our in our in our sectors as well. And uh, my my next question may be akin to asking a parent to to choose their best kid, but what's been the most interesting project that you've 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 put together? Um, what's been the that's tough that's tough uh <laughs> if i'm um, going to come back to it i will but but just just to give a little yeah, flavor no, of, you know what's been a game yeah, changer that you've been involved in there's been um there's been so many cool ones and 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 i guess you know what is what's great about dfc and our new tools right you know we can do a smaller transaction for one or two million dollars that have extreme, you know, development impacts, or we can do a transaction that's worth eight hundred million dollars, right? And so, and so, we 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 capture the full breadth of of of, of various ticket sizes. Um, one deal that I'm, you know, extremely proud of is our investment into a company called Acola. Um, they are actually a member of the PAC DBIA and, and, and Akola is a uh, jewelry manufacturer based in Northern Uganda that hires disenfranchised women. And uh, the leadership of Akola recognized that, you know, um, uh, inputs don't need to be exported out of the continent raw. There is mm. there's the capabilities to actually create value added high-end uh, jewelry on the continent and exporting that to the US. And so um, the Ecola team works with disenfranchised women all throughout Northern Uganda um, and sell you know, beautiful products uh, at Neiman Marcus, Bloomingdale's, uh, Nordstrom's. And you know, that, was, that was a, I think a $5 million investment. So it was, it was, it was on the smaller end um, but recognizing that, you know, there's huge development impacts. There's the U.S. business nexus as well. So it just hit all the high marks for us. Yeah, that's terrific. Thanks, Roku. I'll come back to you a little bit with some more questions. CD, sure. let me go over to you as uh, president of the U.S. African Development Foundation. Um, you know, maybe folks don't know as much about it as, as they should, but I know it as a foundation that punches way above its weight. And... And as an organization that really has its fingers on the pulse of, of businesses across the African continent. So in this new configuration, in this new era of Prosper Africa and, and the DFC, what is new about what you're doing on the continent um, related to this effort to deepen uh, the, the commercial relationships between Africa and the US? Great, Thank, thanks Whitney. And I uh, appreciate you for all you've done um, for U.S. foreign policy towards Africa over the years. Um, obviously want to give a great shout out and appreciation to Teresa and the Africa.com team. Really grateful for this opportunity to share a little bit more about, about USADF, U.S. African Development Foundation, which is sort of this small grant maker that makes big impact, as you said, across the continent. When we look at our work to invest directly in grassroots, small and medium-sized enterprises to promote, promote locally driven economic development, ultimately to create pathways to prosperity where we're impacting lives and livelihoods. One of the things that's really important now more than ever is really seeing USADF and our grants and our financial capital as a tool in the toolkit. And so when you hear work who talk about the DFC and a $5 million investment um, on the front end in a COLA, on the, we're on the, on the front end of that maybe five years ago or 10 years ago. And so we're really in the early stage um, area of enterprise creation that really does lead to poverty, uh, poverty alleviation and, and, and enterprise development. And so that early stage of where, what role do grants play? What role does catalytic capital play in developing African enterprises and African entrepreneurs? And so one thing that's really important to us now um, more than ever as a, as a player, as a tool in the foreign assistance toolkit for Africa is to really see our role linked in that, in that continuum of capital in that where you're talking about large scale investments in, in, in term in potential equity well, on the front end of on front end of that, where's the catalytic capital to de-risk even loans or to de-risk um, other other investment from the private sector or other other agencies. And so we have three unique tools that we bring to the toolkit. One is that is that capital and this grant capital. We're a grant maker, but we also want to make change. And so we're using grants and blended finance, um, some level of philanthropic capital with with um, debt to really create 
the, the right kind of capital needed for early stage enterprises and early stage entrepreneurs. And we only invest in African um, owned and operated entities. So also we're really on the front lines of creating the early stage African entrepreneurs and enterprises that will grow and, and scale to be trade and investment partners with, with the US. So really linking our early stage investments with the longer term vision for prosper and two-way trade and investment. So that capital is important, but also capacity building. And so we bring a network across 21 countries across the continent mm. of local implementing partners who provide that non-financial support to these African enterprises and entrepreneurs. And this is project management support, management finance capabilities. And these are African organizations that are doing business development, business advisory to every grant that we make. And so it's the early stage capital, but it's also the business development advisory support by local African organizations who are um, indigenous and have the lo local context for what those entrepreneurs need. So the capital is there, the capacity building and technical assistance, but ultimately Whitney, one thing is a connection. So we've been successful throughout the past 40 uh, years of US ADF coming out of the 80s and, and now in, in, in 2020, we've been really successful in the startup, in the cooperative, mm -hmm. in the early stage entrepreneurial businesses. But now we really see our grant capital, our early stage investment needs to be linked to follow on funding. And so really positioning those entrepreneurs for greater connections. And again, those connections can be to other US government um, agencies and, and entities. So we're doing a handoff, a baton pass. You know, we did the early right. stage and we're, 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 we're uh, passing them along, but also to the private sector. And one of the things that's more important now is that everyone's looking for deals, right? We hear this all the time, right. you know, so deals. And we have a number of entrepreneurs and enterprises and, and early stage um, entities that we supported that capital, um, supported them with grant capital, but then are we letting a thousand flowers bloom and then let them die? Are we linking them? to others who are looking for that like investment. So one of the things with Prosper is a greater connective tissue of linking our early stage support to grassroots development and SMEs to other US government entities, but also to the private sector and being intentional about that. The one thing that's really different Whitney is the intentionality that we want. We care about investing directly in those businesses and those enterprises and those cooperatives, but we also care about where they go after, our, after us. Right. So, so CD, what's the average size of, of your investment? Great, great question. Um, so we're, we don't make any grant investments or even um, a blended finance perspective in terms of grants larger than 250,000. So wow. 250,000. Right. And this is, this is the beginning of what's known as that missing middle. You're too, yeah. big, you're too big for microfinance, but you're too small for, for maybe um, a financial institution. And so we want to catalyze and really play that signature role in that missing middle of, of up to $250,000 of, of grant capital Again, it could be linked to investment capital, it could be on its own, but it's really playing a signature role in, in, in getting um, those businesses to, to, from startup to scale up. Right, and you mentioned 21 countries. Is, uh, it, you're open in 21 countries, are those like least, de least developed is income? How do you decide those 21 That's countries? It's a, it's a combination of, of the, um, the LECs, but also really thinking about where, where the greatest needs are. So all of our countries predominantly are in the Horn of Africa, and this is from South Sudan and Somalia and, and uh, Uganda. Uh, so we're in the Horn of Africa, we're in the Sahel, we're all throughout the Sahel, and then the Great, Great Lakes regions. We still mm -hmm. do have programs in, in Southern Africa, in places like Zambia and Malawi, in, in Tanzania, but predominantly most of our, our focus is on those, where, where are the most underserved populations? Where is there conflict or post-conflict? Where is startup catalytic capital really needed? Because as we look at the growth story of Africa, we see a number of countries and communities being left behind and underserved. Right. So where is there a real need for catalytic capital for the most marginalized underserved populations where you find smallholder farmers with no access to market, where you find refugees, where you find, you know, the levels of mi migration highest. So we want to be in those places where early stage local economic development can catalyze real transformational growth. And we're in that in that first phase to really serve the underserved in those places. Great. CD, that's awesome. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Ramsey, let me pivot over to you. Um, and let's talk about what was first the trade hubs, then they became the trade and investment hubs. And now I understand they're about to have um, a, a third incarnation, but many of us know that facility as, as one of the uh, big connectors of, of co uh, companies on the continent who wanna take advantage of AGOA. And more recently, company, US companies who wanna understand the market better. But uh, 
t- tell us where the trade hubs are going. Well, thanks, Whitney. Uh, great to see you and, and really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here. Delighted to be here and, and appreciate uh, the invitation from Teresa and the, the Africa.com team. Um, yeah, so I certainly don't want to steal uh, Tori's thunder because um, I know she's going to probably talk about this uh, a bit later. But yeah, I mean, USAID has historically had regional trade and investment hubs that provide uh, business services kind of a, a, all across uh, the continent and has a, a wide range of services. Um, there's been such a demand for these services um, from the regional trade hubs that we're actually modernizing that model to try to meet that demand. Um, so we're, we're really excited about this, um, but we're in the process of launching a, a new uh, Prosper Africa Trade and Investment Program, uh, which will build on and expand the services that were originally provided in the trade hubs. Um, so it's, it's a different way of doing business for us, um, and we'll offer a wide range of, of services, including deal facilitation support, business to business uh, facilitation, um, investor matchmaking that Tori also mentioned, um, but also what, what, what I think is really critical in this uh, effort is targeting the, the really critical policy reforms that'll help create the, the healthy um, environment, business environments. And this is something that USAID has historically done, uh, but we're really elevating this priority um, to really work on the business enabling environment all across uh, the continent. Because I think we would all probably agree that this is one of the biggest challenges that American investors are looking for when they're looking for investment partners um, in African businesses is, is, the, is there a consistent application of the law? Um, is there a commitment to rule of law? Is there a fun- functioning adjudication process? Um, so these are critical to that element uh, of, of attracting American businesses to partner with African businesses. And we think that the Prosper Africa Trade and Investment Program is going to be a real key support mechanism for, uh, for that business-to-business linkage. So Ramsey, you're, you're touching on a critical issue because I think one of the constraints on U.S. investment in Africa is the perception of risk. But what you just spoke about was, you know, strengthening the enabling environment for investment. So, so what metrics uh, do you use? I mean, there are 54 countries, you know, it's finite uh, amount of resources. How do you, how, how do you engage in this critical task of strengthening uh, the enabling environment for investors? And so uh, it's an excellent question. Um, and the, the issue of risk is something that comes up when we ha- when we were engaging with, with US companies. Um, we look at, while it's not the only factor that, that drives US um, foreign assistance um, on the African continent, it is certainly one that we have to t- factor in. Um, we have a number of tools that we take a look at. Um, we now have a U- what's called a USAID Journey to Self-Reliance Roadmap, which is available on the USAID website, which gives us um, a little bit of a snapshot as to where countries are in terms of their journey towards self-reliance. And we look at that in two metrics. One is their capacity, meaning how far along are they on that journey, but then also the commitment um, side, which is um, how committed is the government? Um, And that gives us a little bit of a visual. It's not determinative, meaning that doesn't determine our budget levels for a particular country, but it does give us an idea of which countries are, um, are, are committed um, and which ones are really lagging in that. And then that helps us message to those company countries that we're talking with American companies and they are interested in investing. However, there's reluctance there simply because that risk is too high, meaning you, you've got to focus on L- demonstrating that you are actually committed to uh, your country's development through, through that rule of law, through the po- economic policy reform, so that we can get the countries more integrated into the international economic system. And uh, a demonstration of that commitment, is it fair to say that if a country is at the bottom of the perceptions of a transparency, perceptions of corruption index for, let's say, 10 years, that, that country is not committed. But if we see a government make incredible progress, move 20, 30 uh, slots over five years, is that the kind of uh, government that you would want to work with? That's exactly right. You know, particularly USAID, kind of the sweet spot for us are, are some of the countries that, uh, that may be lagging on the capacity side, but are high on the commitment side. Um, and our, our met, the metrics that we use have about 17 or so indicators that are, that are built into the, the roadmaps. Um, so we're capturing a lot of those uh, metrics that are third party independent. This is not US government uh, owned information. This is uh, open source information. Um, and so it's all there on our website, but there's also um, other resources that are out there as well. But 
if those countries are making progress, then those are the countries that we're certainly going to target for, uh, for higher priority. Um, I, I would also add too that this is the third year that we've released those roadmaps. And so we now have some, some trends mm -hmm. that we can now track, mm -hmm. which, is, which is critical. And that's really ultimately what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. And my last question uh, concerns capacity building and what USAID is uh, doing in this space when it becomes, you know, when it comes to you know, training folks in business and, and, and the nuts and bolts. Yeah, so this is USAID's bread and butter. Uh, this is a, a huge element of what USAID has done for you know, six or seven decades on the African continent. I would also note too that we're really trying to transform the way in which we do business. Um, and we fundamentally want to change the relationship between the U.S. and African countries from an aid-based relationship to a trade and investment-based relationship. Um, and so the business-to-business -business catalyzing, um, facilitating, um, and enabling that business-to-business -business relationship is really at the core of, in my opinion, the future of, of USAID. Um, and, and this is really critical to our contribution to Prosper Africa, which is why we're, we're so excited about it. Um, but we're really trying to transform essentially the way USAID has worked in the future. That's not to say that we're going to uh, lessen the priority of our humanitarian assistance or our global health work. Um, that's a reflection of our values. And so those will always be there. Mm -hmm. um, but we really have never prioritized that business to business um, support. And we're really looking at ways in which we can transform the agency from that perspective, because I really believe it's the future of our agency. That's why we're so excited about um, playing a leading role in the Prosper Africa initiative, because this really is merging that the core functions of USAID, which has been to support the business enabling environment in a particular country with the, the overall goals of Prosper Africa, which is significantly increasing two-way trade between the US and African countries. Great, well, uh, thanks for that, Ramsey. So Bradley, uh, over to you, certainly maybe last, but definitely not least, because it's clear that uh, Exim is back, back in action. You've got a quorum at the board, so you can make decisions, you can make deals, you can, you can finance uh, uh, projects. And uh, it's fair to say that your, finance, your $5 billion financing of the energy infrastructure in, in Mozambique, I think caught everyone's attention, just given the significance um, of that project. Can you talk a little bit about this, uh, this deal and, and, and what it signifies, you know? Um, I mean, it's clear that the US, you know, has been uh, seeing China very active in the infrastructure space. Does this, is this an indication that the US wants to be playing in a more significant way in Africa's infrastructure? Or, you know, is this uh, just gonna be a one-off? Uh, no, it's absolutely an indicator. Just to just answer your question uh, straight up from the top, let me just back up and just, you know, echo the thanks, uh, my, my thanks for your hosting this, moderating this and to the uh, Africa.com team for uh, including XM and, and all of us, I, I think, for the participants, you should recognize that the collective dedication among these U.S. government representatives to enhancing the commercial relationship with uh, Africa is, is is pretty awesome. And indeed, the uh, the Mozambique LNG project is a great great example of the whole of government approach that the U.S. is taking and leveraging all of the commercial tools we have in our toolbox to make things like that happen. So, look, I, I I'm I'm pretty sure that this is well known, but just for those that, that don't know. Um, about the, the project itself. In September 2019, XM's board of directors authorized a direct loan of up to $4.7 billion to support the export of U.S. goods and services for the development and construction of an integrated LNG project in northern Mozambique. So, you know, the project, I don't have to tell you, is expected to have a transformative uh, impact on Mozambique's economy, support thousands of local jobs and create wealth and reduce poverty. And oh, by the way, um, it uh, supports uh, over 16,000 jobs in the U.S. across eight states. So you talk about mutually beneficial trade investment, which is exactly what we, the U.S. government, and specifically Prosper Africa, are trying to achieve. So, um, you know, this is absolutely an indicator of uh, additional uh, infrastructure and, and, and otherwise uh, deals. Uh, to, to work who's point earlier, we are sector agnostic. Uh, you, we want to do lending of all sorts uh, across the continent. Um, so yes, um, we're 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 back in business to your point and looking to do more of this this type of investment. 
So Bradley, give us a little uh, insight in terms of what the supply chain looks like on, on a $5 billion project like this. Presumably it's an American company that came to XM, but also presumably that American company is working with a lot of local companies in, in, in Mozambique. Just uh, flesh that out a, a little bit uh, for us. Yeah, that's right. I um, So this predates my time at XM, but this is really a deal that was eight years in the making. It started, I, I believe, with conversations with, with Anna Darko. You know, the, the deal uh, through acquisitions and so forth has sort of taken on a different life. But as I said, there are a number of um, U.S. Uh, suppliers to the project, uh, you know, services, equipment, you, you know, you name it, um, to the tune of 16,700 jobs. So it's, it's quite the supply chain and it, it's quite the ripple effect when it comes to um, U.S. exporters. You know, I, underpinning all of this is I sort of glossed over an XM 101, which is that we, you know, our, our job is to finance, to support American jobs by financing the support, financing the export of U.S. goods and services. So, so you know, our contribution to the project is providing financing so that U.S. exporters can provide those goods and services to help with the construction development of the project. So um, this is one of the biggest transactions in our history. As I said, huge, huge ripple effect for us and, and hopefully for, uh, for African businesses as well. Great, thanks so much for that. So um, I have a couple questions that have come in from uh, the participants. So let me just sort of um, ask a couple of those and, and start with you, Tori. Um, there's an entrepreneur from Abuja, uh, Nigeria, who has asked if, you know, he can get help from Prosper Africa to secure investments to buy, to get involved with U.S. franchisees, such as McDonald's or Burger King. Is, is that something that um, Prosper Africa can help this entrepreneur with? Thanks, Whitney, and my colleagues for, for all of their comments so far today. And, and to our uh, friend in Abuja who has asked, yes, Prosper Africa can assist you. I mean, fundamentally, you know, we want to take inquiry and identified opportunity and suss that out across the range of support services that the U.S. government has to offer. I do think it's important for me to add and be candid that the likelihood of support from the U.S. government does increase with with a certain amount of project preparation. So those businesses that have really well-developed business plans and detailed investment prospects are the most likely to be well-suited for, for instance, financing in this case, uh, perhaps from the United States, but would encourage that entrepreneur to connect with Prosper Africa um, from, from any entry point and allow that to be reviewed across the interagency and then for us to be able to make a suggestion about the right tool that might most benefit that opportunity. So you're suggesting they might want to get in touch with CD first and do a little yes. we're, business plan we're development. Yes, we're going to give CD's cell phone number. Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah per perfect. Um, let me ask uh, uh, Worku, um, a, a question came in from a management uh, consultant at McKinsey in, in Nairobi who's asking about risk and how does the US government differentiate uh, among African countries based on varying levels of country risk? Um, how do you deal with that at the DFC? If, if you're open for business in, in 53 countries, how, are you, how does risk come into the equation when you're assessing whether to make an investment? No, that's a great question. Um, um, and, and, and you always see that perennial struggle between our credit and risk committees and our investment originators who want to get deals done, right? And, and, and one of the exciting things about, about the DFC and the transition from OPEC is, you know, our kind of risk on tolerance, recognizing that, you know, um, the development finance community has a really important role to play, right, in terms of our additionality and providing financing where, um, you know, the private sector um, um, isn't suitable or considers it too risky. And so, you know, the one thing that, that, that I'm super proud of is that, you know, we uh, conduct our own underwriting and our own diligence. We have some of the best best project finance and SME finance specialists uh, in-house. And so each of our investment teams conduct their own risk analysis and their own diligence. And this is, um, you know, and this is, this is hefty work. I mean, it's not something where, you know, you'll 
reach out to us with a proposal and, and, and you get an answer back in a few weeks. I mean, this is a couple months process. Um, our teams will fly out from Washington to your project site. Mm -hmm. We'll conduct interviews with business owners. We'll do a market assessment to check, to, 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 to confirm market opportunities. Um, and then that begins uh, our, uh, our internal underwriting process. Um, you know, we also rely uh, on our colleagues uh, at uh, our embassies and USAID missions in the region, mm -hmm. right? They have a lot mm -hmm. of local expertise and a lot of on the ground knowledge. And so um, that is something that, you know, we, we, we definitely rely on as well. Yeah, that's great. So, so just quickly back to you, uh, Tori. I mean, I think work who just uh, touched on something is that, you know, this is, this, this is sort of a Washington based uh, conversation. But, but, you know, we, we have embassies in virtually every African uh, continent. So can you just give us a little flavor of, of if, you're, if you're a business person, you know, in Zambia, in Tanzania, does it make sense to try to reach out to the U.S. Embassy to, um, you know, start the conversation or should they just go online and uh, connect with you? Thanks, Whitney. I appreciate that. So I, I believe one of the great accomplishments of the Prosper Africa initiative thus far, at least on the U.S. government coordination piece, is the fact that we have established these teams at every single embassy on the continent that are dedicated to looking at two-way trade and investment opportunities and advancing them. So when you have a uh, foreign commercial service officer present, a, a State Department econ officer, representatives from USAID, in some instances, the DFC as well, they are working as a harmonized unit. So if you are a local African business engaging with your embassy, absolutely uh, is a suitable approach in order to inquire about how might I receive some assistance from the US government. And again, I don't want that to deter anyone from, from engaging on the Washington side either, if that's via um, Prosper Africa at USAID.gov, you can an email and we are all speaking to one another. So any place that you come in, you're going to get the breadth of the full response of the US government. Yeah, so in the previous panel, uh, Tibor referred to deal teams. Yes. What, what's a deal team? How does that work? And, and how does the entrepreneur access a deal team? Absolutely. So uh, what is the deal team? The deal team is an interagency group of, of folks at the embassy in your country that are reviewing on a weekly basis um, leads and opportunities and inquiries uh, for um, how the Prosper Africa Initiative will advance to a trade and investment. And how do you approach a deal team? You can contact your local embassy, but you can also come directly to us via the online digital resource center by emailing prosperafrica at usaid.gov. And the very first thing that I'm gonna do if I receive that email is reach out to the field and to post and understand from their perspective, you know, is this a viable opportunity? How can we help advance to this opportunity? So again, it's not to sidestep the question, but to very right. earnestly say that they can come at any, any entry point. Right, so you, you can go online to connect with Prosper Africa, or you can call up the embassy, ask the embassy operator to connect you with the deal team and you're up and running. <laughs> Absolutely. And one point I will note is we're working very hard and exploring the feasibility with our State Department colleagues to have direct email addresses for a point of contact at every post where there is a Prosper Africa deal team present, which are at all of them, to ensure that perhaps you can even make that more seamless than picking up the phone and calling the embassy operator uh, and have a direct email inbox for every post. That's something we're exploring and working on, and I hope to be able to advance quickly. Awesome. That sounds great. CD, let me ask you a question that came from a, uh, a CEO of a media production company in Port Harcourt. You, you, you sort of intimated that is um, uh, remarks, but this individual uh, uh, notes that a significant par portion of Nigeria's GDP and its employment comes from the media sector and specifically Nollywood. And this individual is interested to know whether you know ADF might whether ADF could help the creative sectors uh, in, in Africa when deciding to, to make an investment. I may I, I realize this may not be part of the conflict and post conflict environment, but ha have you worked uh, in this critical sector um, I think, in Africa? I think great, no, I think the great question. 
ultimately we're looking at, um, you know, whatever the, the business opportunity, is it going to increase incomes, create jobs, grow revenues that are going to impact a local population of people? And so that's one of the first lenses that we look at, the social impact um, assessment, the economic impact assessment of the, of the opportunity. Where we have seen, and most of our funding goes to the areas of highest need in terms of where most Africans earn their livelihoods. And so we have, you know, 70% of all our investments are somewhere along the agricultural supply chain. More recently, and that's also linked to US government priorities with mm -hmm. the Global Food Security Act and Feed the Future. We then look at power. And so Africa's need for power, especially in those um, underserved places and, and, and populations. And so with Power Africa and off grid energy, we're in solar, wind, um, biogas, biodigesters. But in the area that you know really well, Whitney, from the YALI, um, the Young African Leaders Initiative, we do fund a number of agnostic entrepreneurs, especially mm -hmm. young who are looking at opportunities to increase incomes, create jobs, grow revenues, and really build local economic empowerment. And that's where we have seen some investments with young entrepreneurs who are in the, um, to, running social enterprises that are in the creative industry. And that is, that is where, in the entrepreneurial um, realm, is where we have funded the creative industries and people looking at really creative solutions um, around media usage and video production and ICT writ large to really impact local challenges somewhat around agriculture, energy, or education, but looking at it from an entrepreneurial lens. And so while it isn't a sector that we focus on because we're focused primarily on those, those drivers of, of the, um, that really create employment opportunities that really um, increase incomes in, in terms of entrepreneurship, agriculture, and energy. In the creative industries, through entrepreneurship and social enterprises, we have seen real opportunities. And Nigeria, in particular, is um, a place where we have had some of those investments. We also have a relationship with the Lego State Employment Trust Fund. So okay. in, Lego State, in Lego State, we do work with the Lego State Employment Trust Fund to co-fund investments. And some of those investments are in ICT and media and, and the creative um, industries and that's Lego State specific. So not, not core to our work, but not um, outside of the realm of possibility right. in terms of broader investments in entrepreneurship. Yeah. So, so, so CD, let's just drill down on, I'm interested in that relationship with uh, Lego, uh, Lego State, sort of the public-private uh, right. pu partnership. Um, do you have relationships like that in, in other parts of the continent? One of the great value, the answer is yes. And one of the great value um, propositions that USADF brings because of all of our investments um, are in African enterprises and African entrepreneurs. So we don't invest in American companies. We, we can facilitate relationships with American companies that want to invest in African businesses. So we're on the demand side, creating African the burgeoning African private sector that can buy U.S. goods and services or supply U.S. goods and services to to uh, to American businesses. So the B two B is where we live, but on the Africa creating the African businesses that can trade and invest with the U.S. There are many nations: Uganda, Senegal, um, Nigeria with Lego State, Benin, Malawi, um, Cote d'Ivoire. All of those nations they actually co-fund alongside U.S. ADF. That's awesome, Whitney, and so. In Uganda, in Benin, in Senegal, in Cote d'Ivoire, in Lego State, we put down, let's for instance, two million dollars a year. That's going to small grants to African enterprises and entrepreneurs. Lego State matches that funding. L Ugandan government matches that funding. So then we deploy. If it's two million, we deploy in Cote d'Ivoire four million dollars, two million of U.S. taxpayer dollars to fund African uh, grassroots SMEs, and two million from the Ivorian government. And we program four million that's going directly to Ivorian entrepreneurs. And again, this is in Uganda, this is in Lego State, this is in Senegal. And so the African governments really use the American influence and our ability to reach those underserved populations, to reach their own people. And so for them, it's not really funding the U.S. government. It's, it's, it's using our expertise and our connections to really build better African businesses. And so the Lego State is one example, but across the continent, this is one of the unique value propositions that we bring because we have the gift authority to take African government's money and to, and to then redeploy it back to places and populations that are hard to reach even for them, but it creates this local economic development that is driven by American ingenuity, but African ownership and local ownership by the community yeah. in, in which we're investing that money. And, and, and how do you find those businesses? You know, so and how do they how do they find you? Great, great, and that's the number one question, right? How do I get some? How do I get? How do I get a grant from USADF? So we exactly there are some closed pool opportunities 
in closed pools, meaning through the Yali network, the Young African Leaders um, Network. And so we invest um, in, in Yali entrepreneurs that are coming through the embassy. A new initiative, the Academy for Women's Entrepreneurship, spearheaded by the State Department. Those graduates of the Academy for Women's Entrepreneurship, we have um, a closed pool of funding available to them. But we have RFPs, we have solicitations, we have mm -hmm. challenges. We've done um, a women in energy challenge across seven countries. We've done a, a, a energy off grid energy challenge for solar, wind, hydro, bio, early stage African enterprises throughout the Sahel. And it was called the Sahel Off Grid Energy Challenge. So through mm -hmm. challenges, through RFPs, through solicitations, but most importantly, in every country, just like we're part of the deal teams in those embassies, we also have a local country office in 21 countries. I see. We have a country program coordinator who anyone can go to to talk about when we're going to be open and accepting proposals, um, you know, what, what the funding level will look like and the opportunities that we're trying to catalyze and to fund. And the most important thing is to think through what problem are you solving? Because we're in, again, that business of really trying to look at the social impact um, and the economic impact, and in some instances in the off-grid space, the environmental impact of those of those um, enterprises that we would support. So think through what problem you're solve, solving, what solution you're trying to catalyze, and how the funding that ADF can provide is catalytic and, be, and can be an, an impact multiplier to other funding you might get or other investments that you might you might need. And so we want to play a, a unique role in starting um, and scaling up enterprises. But ultimately, Whitney, to your question before, we want to link them to follow on yeah. funding. That could be private um, investors from the U.S. or throughout Africa. And so we're really we're really in this business of trying to create real linkages between early stage enterprises that can then um, develop, grow, and ultimately scale through greater connections with other forms of capital. Great, great, thanks. Well, um, Ramsey, let me go to you. Um, CD made reference several times to Yali and the Young Africa Leaders Network, which is probably one of the most dynamic uh, uh, programs that, that the U.S. has developed over the last uh, uh, decades. Can you just give us a little flavor of, of how Yali fits into the Prosper Africa uh, dynamic? Is, is, is the point of contact the regional leadership centers? Is it the Mandela Washington Fellows? I mean, um, the, the Yali... Uh, participants that I've met have just been extraordinary individuals and just would love to uh, understand better how, how, how that piece fits into this conversation. Sure, of course. No, you're absolutely right. Yali is, is uh, uh, an incredible program and uh, the, the young professionals that, that go through that program are just absolutely extraordinary and I'm incredibly inspired every time I get a chance to see them uh, and hopefully we'll see them again uh, when we get back to the continent. Um, so, uh, you know, USAID is, is, is quite decentralized, as you know, and I think always the best point of contact is going to be the, the USAID mission in that particular country. We have missions and offices in almost 40 countries uh, around Africa, and so that's always going to be the very first point uh, of contact. Now, I do believe that there's incredible synergies between um, YALI and Prosper Africa, simply because we are always looking for young entrepreneurs, um, which is, as you know, one of the pillars of, of YALI. Um, and so ways in which we can make linkages between the Pros Prosper Africa partners, uh, meaning those that we have uh, been in contact with from the Prosper Africa perspective, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> We got a little visitor here, um, <laughs> but also, um, uh, but those uh, those those Yali participants in many ways are starting businesses. They're actually beginning in their careers in a particular um, company, and so we absolutely want to use Yali as a source to really feed into the overall goals of Prosper Africa. But the best way to get in touch with uh, that the Yali program or to be that synergy between perhaps Prosper Africa and the Yali program is, is always going to be the USAID mission um, at post as well as the, the even whether it be the deal teams or the uh, the off the, the State Department officers at post but anybody within the embassy construct can assist. Great. Um, uh, Ramsey, I got a question here from a, a finance director of a mobile telco from Kigali who is interested in learning how AID has adapted to the COVID environment how you know we're, we can't travel, we've got to be much more uh, you know, adept at, at making use of the digital environment. How has this uh, uh, played out in uh, the work of USAID in Africa? Yeah, it's a really good question. We, we Believe it or not, it's, it's really been quite seamless. We transitioned to the Google platform uh, several years ago, um, which I think has been, um, I think, a, a, 
a remarkable transformation for USAID in terms of our own operations. So it, um, we really haven't seen any major disruption in our own pro in our own operational um, uh, approach, and um, vast majority of our programs are moving on. So there shouldn't be uh, much concern about how USAID operates in country. Um, and so uh, we're 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 moving forward as aggressively as we ever have been. And a lot of folks working remotely. We are. Um, there are many who are returning. Uh, we did have a global authorized departure. So we, um, in March and April, a lot of people did leave and um, some stayed, uh, but they're really on their way back. Um, and so we're seeing a significant return to those missions. However, um, it, it, again, it really has not impacted our ability to do our jobs and to, and to project our, our, our work and, and, and manage our programs. So people are working remotely from all around the world, but we're starting to see them start to trickle back. Great, uh, uh, thanks for that. Uh, Bradley, I got a question from a head of corporate banking at a global bank based in Nairobi, who's interested in procurement and what can be done to support governments to improve their uh, procurement practices. And just curious, is this something that falls under uh, Exim's uh, uh, ambit? Well, I, I, I think so. I, and I think I'd, I'd answer that by saying, you know, we're a bank. Uh, the transactions that we finance must must be bankable, re reasonable assurance of return, and so forth. Um, there are risks associated with any buyer, public or, or private. But um, uh, you know, we've talked about sort of where we're open. XM is open for business in forty eight of the fifty four countries across Africa, mm -hmm. and you know, we've got a number of things that we consider when it when it comes to risk, but. Uh, you know, our borrowers are, are sovereign or sub-sovereign -so governments, public center entities, or, or private sector buyer, buyers, so it really runs the gamut. Um, so I, I think the short answer would, would be uh, yes. Um, I, I think that uh, the, the procurement, um, you know, advising that we would provide would come during sort of the loan application process, but um, I, I hope that answers the, you know, the question uh, from, from the gentleman. Right. Well, I think it's, a, it's certainly going to be an ongoing concern. Let me follow up with another uh, question that came, came in from um, Hermanus, from the CEO of a green energy company. And, you know, you mentioned the LNG project in, in Mozambique. What else are you doing in, in the energy space, in the green energy space? And, and, and can you say a little bit how XM's work uh, links up with Power Africa? Yes, well, there, there are a number of projects we have um, in the renewable energy, energy efficiency, energy storage space, and looking to do more. Let me, let me just take this opportunity to talk a, a little bit about the program on China and transformational exports, which was part of our December 2019 reauthorization. It basically charges XM with advancing uh, American comparative leadership in 10 transformational export categories, one of which is, as I said, renewable energy energy efficiency and energy storage. So, um, you know, the charge is quite simply to lean into transactions in those uh, sectors and energy uh, is a big one. We have had a number of engagements over the years uh, in the, uh, in the uh, Power Africa initiative that uh, we very much hope to continue. Um, uh, as we mentioned earlier, the Mozambique deal is one of which we are very proud. It's one of Exim's largest ever, and indeed one of the largest ever on the, on the continent. So. I, I think that's a clear indicator of our willingness to, to lean into this industry and tra transactions therein. Yeah, but um, Ramsey, let me go back to you because I know uh, Power Africa's uh, uh, house at USAID. Can you just give us an update on uh, where the program is today? Sure, of course. Um, Power Africa is moving forward um, uh, just as it ever has. It's really um, done a terrific job in advancing uh, the, the the mandate of bringing electricity to uh, those in need within uh, within Africa, the as you know the the mandate of Power Africa takes an all of the above approach, um, but green energy and and renewable energy is one of the primary focuses of of Power Africa. They've done uh, north of 130 uh, deals in terms of bringing them to financial closure, many of which have been in uh, in the renewable energy side, particularly in solar, um, and they're looking at and they're pursuing a number of of solar. Uh, opportunities as well. So um, it's going like gangbusters. We've got a great team working on it um, and, uh, and it's, uh, it's doing well. Yeah.
Great. Well, I can see that we're sort of um, at the end of our time here. Um, I, I would just be remiss if I didn't talk about just Covington for, for, for one minute. And, you know, I'm just proud to chair the Africa practice at Covington. We have more than 100 attorneys in our offices in the U.S., Europe, Africa, Asia. We have a Johannesburg office that's Africa facing. We work in project finance. We work on compliance. We work on what we call global problem solving and just feel like we're part of this conversation. We're part of working with US government agencies to uh, deepen the US African engagement. We work hard to uh, leverage the private sector for accelerated economic development. And it's just uh, been a privilege to be able to moderate this conversation. And so let me thank all the uh, participants and turn it back to you, Teresa. Well, thank you, Whitney, and I will underscore the little commercial that you give for Covington, there. <laughs> even though I've known you for a long time. I've had an opportunity to get to know Covington since you joined the practice, and that has given us a platform to engage on many efforts, um, this one being one of them. Um, I want to thank you, Whitney, for moderating this panel, and I want to thank all of the panelists. Um, you know, everyone says how hard we work, and we work extremely hard, but it doesn't feel like work when you get a chance to work with friends. And that's certainly been the case in reaching out to Whitney, to Warco and CD. Thank you as people I've known for a long time for joining this panel. And the good thing is even though this may be virtual, I found in doing these webinar series, you actually can make new friends virtually. And so my new friends that I have made and didn't have an opportunity to work with previously are Tori, Ramsey and Bradley. And so I certainly have learned a lot about the important work that each of you do in your respective platforms and I hope that you will join us back on Africa.com in other contexts in the future. Um, this is the part of the program. If you were here at the end of the first session, um, what I said then, I'll sit, repeat here. This is when we're all supposed to be on stage together. I'm supposed to shake your hand. We're supposed to take a picture together. Maybe someone will take a, a screenshot. I think someone on the Africa.com will do that so we can see all of us together at some point in the future. And I'm supposed to give you all a little box that has a pen or, or some kind of memoir in it. And so since we're not able to do that, um, I'd like to tell you that Africa.com will make a contribution in your honor, each of you individually in your honor to the Student Sponsorship Program of South Africa, a fantastic organization that um, many people at Africa.com are, are quite involved with that is creating uh, transformation in South African society by finding really smart young people and sending them to South Africa's leading uh, prep schools. So we will make a contribution in each of your names individually to thank you for sharing your knowledge and expertise. And I'd also like, um, while we're on this particular panel, to just thank um, one of uh, Tori's colleagues, Nina Prayer, who has been very, very helpful to us in assembling um, the speakers for this panel. So thank you very much. We want to make sure, you know, this panel is a real nuts and bolts panel. You've heard now from the Africa heads at five different agencies across, um, across the U.S. government that help businesses in Africa, small and large, um, in a variety of range of ways to improve trade, investment, and technical assistance. And we want to make sure you know how to reach them. So here is specific information. I'll email prosperafrica at usa.gov. You can learn more at prosperafrica.dfc.gov. Uh, these slides will be available um, as part of the permanent record of this meeting, available on virtualconferenceafrica.com. So if you didn't pick it up right now, you can always come back to get this information again on the virtualconferenceafrica.com website. Um, I'd also like to thank our sponsors. Um, we've had you know, fantastic sponsorship from three very significant institutions who have made this possible. Those three institutions, once again, are General Electric. Um, again, Farid Fazoa spoke on our first panel. He is ably supported by Patricia Buzwa, who has been a longtime supporter of these webinars. This is our first opportunity to engage with Bank of America, in particular, Yvonne Eich, who was kind enough to share her wisdom with us on the first panel. And here on this panel, as you have seen, Whitney Snydman has contributed well beyond any financial contribution through his excellent moderation of this very important subject, um, as we've heard from the agency heads today. So thank you to Whitney and to Covington very much for your support for this effort. As we move into panel three, uh, this is an event organized by Africa.com. And Africa.com has its own unique editorial voice. 
And that voice is such that while we have been asked by our colleagues on the African continent to hear from the US government, um, it wouldn't be Africa.com if it was a one-way conversation. We have assembled the most senior members of the US government who relate to doing business uh, with Africa, inter intercontinental country trade. Um, but we want to hear from African business leaders here at Africa.com. And we want to hear the good, the bad. We want to hear their perspectives. We want to hear what it is like to be an African business leader to have done business with the United States. Um, Yvonne Ike, as I mentioned earlier, has been very helpful in assembling this panel of business leaders. Yvonne Ike of Bank of America. They, they have used their relationships to reach out to the six experienced leaders that we have. These leaders have been involved in doing business with the U.S. from all sorts of perspectives. Some have investment from the U.S. Some have actually engaged with the agencies we just heard from. Um, some have U.S. Uh, clients and trade partners. Uh, they engage with the U.S. in many, many different ways. And I think that it's important for us as we have this conversation to recognize that we are talking about partnerships. While the U.S. is a very advanced economy, um, we want to acknowledge the tremendous success that Africans have had in the business realm. Going back to the Ashantis, thinking about the tremendous operational expertise that Shaka Zulu demonstrated, thinking about how Africans have been able to create trade amongst themselves, amongst the African um, nations, and Africa today is at the forefront of an expansionist set of policies at the African Union to create the African Free Trade Agreement. While the rest of the world is moving into more of a protectionist mode, Africa is recognizing the benefits of acting as a bloc and what the, and what the economic benefits will be to Africa and its people for doing so. So we want to acknowledge the tremendous icons who have been self-made um, and those who have partnered with governments, local and international, to achieve their success. So with that, um, much like in the last panel, we are very privileged today, not only to have fantastic speakers, but to have fantastic moderators. And I'd like to introduce Hubert Nanso, who is the founder and the chief executive and chair of, of Africa Investor. I'm sure everybody involved in this call today has heard of Africa Investor. The Africa Investor Group is a very important player in convening institutional investors in particular with respect to significant uh, flows of capital onto the African continent. Hubert, um, like our last um, moderator, uh, once I spoke to everyone on this panel, everybody already knew Hubert. He's had pre-existing relationships with pretty much every important business leader on the continent and he was able in that way to very quickly figure out what needs to be said and what needs to be done on this panel and how to position um, what comes out of this conversation. Um, I should mention that we are extremely privileged to have had so many members of the US government involved in the first two panels. And please know that the members of the US government are staying on for this panel to hear what you have to say, because this is an incredibly important opportunity. There aren't many opportunities to hear from leaders like those people on this panel with respect to what their experiences have been and what their recommendations are. Uh, this is a group of business leaders who span industries and span geographies, but all of whom come to this conversation with a great depth of experience in doing business both in Africa and with the US in a variety of counterparty arrangements. So it, with that, I'm going to turn this over to the very capable hands of Hubert Danso to moderate this panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Teresa, and um, good day, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Teresa mentioned, my name is Hubert Danso, and I'm the chairman of Africa Investor, also the chairman of the African Union's Continental Business Network, the CBN. And I also chair the CFA New York's Global Asset Owners Advisory Council, made up of uh, the US's leading uh, institutional investors, pension funds, endowments, and foundations investing across the world. And it's uh, my great pleasure to be the chair for this particular Hear It From African Business Heads Roundtable Dialogue. It's always a pleasure as Africa Investor to partner with um, Africa.com. Um, you do incredible work, uh, Teresa, and we're always there to support you. 
and it's a, a, another distinct pleasure to obviously chair this um, particular round table, which is really, as you say, going to communicate the views and perspectives of African business leaders on the uh, opportunities and challenges of doing business with the United States. And hopefully we'll provide some uh, guidance for those who are considering following in uh, our footsteps. This particular US-Africa uh, summit is coming at a, a very interesting time and, and at a very pertinent time as the world grapples with the economic damage uh, from COVID-19, causing all of us to, in many cases, review and reset our business strategies, partnerships, and explore new or deepen existing commercial relationships. We're seeing this play out on a daily basis in the rapid reconstellation of global supply chains and third party business and investment relationships. This is really a seminal moment and opportunity for US Africa business and investment partnerships. And I think it's from what I've seen so far, clearly a moment that's not lost on the US administration as can be seen from the existence and uh, operation of the Presidential Business Advisory Council on doing business in Africa the impressive panel that we've just had, and the very senior private sector participation and government participation in this particular uh, summit. I think the words, of, um, the words that came out of the McKinsey report were clearly not lost on uh, the US administration or the private sector. Um, you know, the report stated very clearly that global business leaders who misunderstand Africa run the risk of missing out on the 21st century's great growth opportunities. It then went on to say, in our experience, the instinct of most business people is to underestimate Africa's size and potential as a market and overestimate the challenges of doing business there. So on this panel, you're gonna hear directly from the continent's uh, leaders, the, the most uh, prolific business leaders from large and small companies, uh, youth and women-led institutions, as uh, Teresa mentioned, working across uh, multiple uh, sectors. And on the panel, let me just give a, a quick introduction. We have Mr. Admasu Tedesi, who is the president um, and uh, CEO of uh, TDB Bank. We have Mr. Balaji Balogun, who is the chief executive officer of Chapel Hill uh, Denham. We have Indi Munaneli, who is the managing partner of Sahel Consulting uh, Agriculture and Nutrition and she's also the co-founder of uh, Ace Foods and the founder of uh, Leap Africa. We have Mr. Ayini Lowell, who, uh, Abuyeli, who is the founder of Andela and Future Africa and the founder and former managing director of the fintech business uh, Flutterwave. We have Ms. Na Sakal Akoyeti, who is the founder and CEO of Eugenia Shia. And uh, we have uh, Mr. Kuseni Dlamini, who is the chairman of the board of South Africa's Mass Mart Holding. So to get us started, um, we are going to turn right now to each business leader to provide their introductory remarks and perspectives on doing business uh, with the United States. And uh, we're going to start with uh, Admasu Tedesi, um, who has uh, got a very star-studied uh, career across many different institutions, both public uh, and the private sector. And he's really transformed not only his own institution, but he's blaze the trail that most development finance institutions around the world are now beginning to take lessons from him about how they can reinvigorate some of their own institutions. So over to you, Admasu. Thank you, Hubert, and uh, thank you, Africa.com and all the partners for this very interesting discussion. We're very pleased to be a part of this. Uh, very quickly, just a few words on uh, TDB. As you've heard from Hubert, we are a financial institution we're quite specialized. We cover some 22 African countries, mostly in Eastern and Southern Africa. We have a balance sheet of about $7 billion and we finance several different sectors. So we're active in power and transport, agriculture, telcos, industry, almost all sectors. And, and of course, uh, being a specialized financial institution, we do uh, cover a lot of the sustainable development goals, about half of our portfolio is dedicated to the SDGs and uh, about 80% of our power portfolios in the renewable energy space as well. So we are commercial, but we're very developmental as well. And we, we really believe in pushing the climate finance agenda. Uh, we do have a great story of growth as Hubert has mentioned, and that really mirrors the great growth we've seen in Africa since the turn of the millennium. I think as Hubert was saying, it's not very obvious to 
to, to distant observers how much Africa has grown and how attractive and big the economy has become relative to where it used to be. And of course, we know that demographics are also going to be taking us further out in this regard. So we, uh, we've been growing at almost 23% uh, cumulative annual growth rates for the past 10 years. So we've got uh, a very strong story and we're very active. We work very closely with U.S. agencies and also U.S. businesses. But of course, there's a lot more that can be done, which is why we think this kind of engagement that's been arranged is really important because we think the U.S. has so much more to offer and we believe Africa has a great deal to offer as well. Fantastic, Admasu. I think the African continental free trade area, as Teresa mentioned, is really at the forefront of everyone's mind. But then when we just look at the time frame, January 1, 2021, just share some views with us about you know, how you're preparing as the TDB and, and how you see the continent from the private sector standpoint, uh, you know, getting ready to really take advantage of that opportunity and then sort of help us understand the role or additional role, if it's not currently being played, um, that US institutions could, could, could support and provide in that particular process? Well, you know, the, um, the, the trade agenda of Africa, not just with the world, but with itself, has been an aspiration for quite some time. And I think what, what again, is not obvious to many observers is how far Africa has begun to, to, to move forward in terms of this vision. So those, of course, who know, we, we've always had regional markets uh, that have been looking to get off the ground. Now we have a continental market that's essentially been uh, given life. It's going to take some time for it to move. But this is not just a piece of paper for those who are just wondering whether this will have a real impact or not. There's been also very strong infrastructure development happening at the same time in terms of roads, but also rail. Just to give some examples, we have about three mega railway projects that have been implemented and are currently under implementation just over the past 10 years, still some of them are ongoing. And you're talking about $15 billion investment. Uh, most of these are in East Africa, uh, in, in Kenya and Tanzania and Ethiopia. And these have uh, begun to lay the groundwork for, for, for much more meaningful uh, logistical movements that will make trade much more efficient and therefore more profitable. This is just one example. In the power space as well, we've seen transmission lines being laid across borders African are trading power, not just goods, but also power in terms of that type of service. So there is a great deal happening. And I think as, as this infrastructure continues to, to gain momentum, I think American firms have a huge opportunity. Uh, it, it, whether it's rail or power or telecoms, there's huge amount of content. Of course, the green energy agenda is going to also give impetus to to more mining that needs to happen to support the minerals and the metals that need to support the, the support of uh, the development of batteries. And, and of course that itself will also give uh, up uh, lots of opportunities for investment in mining. We know the US has quite a bit of mining uh, capability as well, in addition to the oil and gas that is uh, perhaps better known. So the trade agenda is gonna be very strong. Uh, we are, have uh, regional markets. We have the common market of Eastern and Southern Africa. You're talking about uh, close to half the continent that's already integrated uh, through an existing common market arrangement. So there is a lot of integration that's been going on. It's just, it's very quiet. It's been under construction in terms of just getting the institutional frameworks and the infrastructure to work together. But it is a, a very promising uh, indication of what can be achieved in the future to, to, to look at Africa as one big market. Fantastic. And then finally, before I move on to our, our next speaker, I mean, we've heard um, quite a bit in this discussion already, and it's, uh, it's an issue that you're, you're very familiar with, uh, I think, to the point now where it's almost being described as an infodemic uh, in terms of this uh, perception of risk or, or actual versus perceived risk uh, on the continent. Based on the, the, the success that you've had and the engagement with the U.S. institutions, you know, it would be interesting to get your views and advice about how to address this issue of perceived versus uh, actual uh, risk because there's quite a there, there's quite a gap there and it was interesting because just last week we heard from a a, a, a former um, U.S. diplomat and they were explaining that uh, to a group of SMEs that you know you really need to work harder on polishing your message and your pitch because the type of investment that you're looking for 
versus the perception of the risk, even if that perception of the risk were real, you have a risk mitigant built in there by, by virtue of the makeup and the nature and, and, the, and the sheer scale of the market that, that your returns would be protected. And that's what this, this post, um, this, this former uh, uh, diplomat is now raising money in Silicon Valley and you know, setting up offices right across the continent. And he attributes a lot of his success to actually being able to articulate um, and defend and motivate around the risk management approach. How do you go about it? Well, you know, this, this risk perception issue is, uh, is, is a very important uh, discussion point, I think, for today, because there is a huge lag in terms of the reality versus uh, how people see it. Uh, just to give you a very practical example, we, as a, as a bank, of course, that has to apply modern risk mitigation techniques, uh, we buy various insurance products just in order to sort of optimize our balance sheet and ensure that we're in good order with the ratings agencies. We spend about $35 million insurance products. And most of those who insure us are from, from the Lloyd's markets in the US, in the, in the UK, sorry. And, and you know, you're talking about global insurance companies who readily buy up all of our risk mitigation instruments for African risk, risk management. And we've had zero claims over 20 years, zero claims. And this is why whenever we, we put our offer out there, we get so much buy-in from these various companies who want to underwrite some of our risks. Now, this is the truth. It's very profitable to do that. Why? Because the reality is that the risks just don't materialize, generally speaking. Say that there's no risk, there's of course risk and, and, and returns are always adjusted on a risk basis, but this is just a very practical viewpoint from our own experience where, where we've managed to, to, to give comfort to our partners around the world that if you come in and participate in African risk, you will do well. And then I'm talking about specific numbers. So, so I, think, I think really in the end, it's about distance and also about not applying oneself, not getting closer to the markets, talking to people and getting on the ground and looking at the realities. And finally, do you think there are any products that Prosper Africa or the US administration or the insurance market could, 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 could uh, you know, benefit from bringing in to, to, to address this mismatch? Well, I think, I think the, there is need for facilitation. I think if you look at other parts of the world that have done tremendous amounts of business with Africa over the past 10, 15 years, that has been partly because they've been facilitated by their own agencies and their own specialized financial institutions. So the Europeans are very active. The Asians are very active. Uh, we work with both the Europeans and the Asians. Uh, the Americans also have been present, but nowhere near as active and as, as interested from an appetite perspective compared to the others. And I think, I think, for instance, just looking at U.S. banks and U.S. institutional investors who sometimes want to work with us, one of the complaints they have is, is African multilaterals or African institutions like us are not formally recognized uh, by the U.S. guidelines where it come, when, when, when one is dealing with multilateral institutions. So U.S. investors and U.S. banks feel disadvantaged and they often, you know, lobby and try to get a, an adjustment or a reform introduced to, to deal with this constraint. But it doesn't create a, playing, a level playing field for, for American firms and American banks. I know a recommendation has been made to the U.S. Commerce Secretary, the Secretary to address this issue. And we're hoping that... Uh, the U.S. will begin to, to recognize African international banks so that we work even better and leverage uh, the credit enhancement opportunities that come with that. Yeah, fantastic. No, that's absolutely right. I'm aware of, I'm aware of some of those submissions. And I think it also, it also applies to the ability to engage with uh, African capital markets and stock exchanges as well, which sort of certainly seem to be a little bit off of the radar. But I was um, encouraged to hear from certain um, colleagues within the U.S. administration that they sort of recognize that economic and private sector related development assistance that does not create a link to the African capital markets um, is almost like putting uh, you know, water into a perforated bucket. So I think that the, the mindset is changing and I think the you know, uh, advocacy of, of, of you know, colleagues like ourselves and, and the local teams uh, from these agencies, it, it will provide a, a lot of better insight as we move forward. But I think there is still a lot of um, movement um, within 
the administration um, to sort of take a, a more enlightened view in terms of taking a more sophisticated perception of Africa. And that's why I'm going to turn to Balaji now, because I know that Balaji works closely um, with the institutional investment community, both within the continent and uh, the US. So um, over to you, Balaji, just to sort of share your, 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 your sort of uh, general high level views and then just tell us about, you know, the experiences that you've had working with the um, institutional investment community uh, in the US. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very, very much, Hubert. And thank you also, um, Africa.com, for organizing this and giving us an opportunity um, to share a few thoughts. Um, briefly, our business, Chapel Hill Denim, is Nigeria's leading investment firm. And the firm, you know, is also Nigeria's leading alternatives asset manager. We like to think of our business as a business that's very much focused on areas that we believe are accretive, you know, to Africa and Nigeria's economic, as well as sustainable development. We do this in three, four particular ways. We do it primarily through the work we do in infrastructure financing, in green financing, where we've, you know, led the sovereign's, you know, green bond issuance, also led the issuance of the first you know, corporate green bond on the continent um, for Access Bank, one of our local banks, through gender lens investing where we're working with female as well as youth-owned businesses um, in Nigeria, and most especially through development of domestic capital markets. And we think that is really, really essential to financing sustainably in the continent. Um, over the last four or five years, one of the pieces of work you know, that perhaps, you know, you know, we're most proud of, and which is really a reason that we've been engaged with a number of US entities domestically beyond US portfolio investors who historically we've worked with, you know, over the last decade or thereabouts, um, is creating a local currency debt infrastructure debt fund, which we call the Nigeria Infrastructure Debt Fund. Perhaps the best piece of legislation that Nigeria has created over the last decade and a half is Nigeria's pensions legislation, which basically has taken a pensions industry, which from a standing start of zero about 14 years ago, now has $25 billion of assets under management. 80 odd percent of that money was financing the government mostly invested around government bonds and treasury bills. And when you think that the government as a factor of the economy here is only 7% of GDP, then to a large extent, you'll understand Nigeria and perhaps most of Africa's development conundrum, which is essentially, you know, that the private sector to a large extent um, really is starved of capital. So what have we done? We've created this fund, we've been able to attract 22 of Nigeria's pension fund investors who never ever invested in infrastructure, you know, to invest in infrastructure as, the, as an asset class. Um, a US corporation, Cummins, um, you know, was our first investee, um, you know, built, you know was, our, was our first investment for that fund. And that fund today is the only source of long-term local currency investing for infrastructure across the market. Um, but that's really one, one good example of what is possible. Perhaps the biggest opportunity that we all have, and really for me that opportunity that we have that can be transformational and where both the US's you know, Development Finance Corporation as well as groups you know, like MEDA, you know, which are financed by USAID can play a really critical role is recognizing that ultimately all of Africa's problems to a large extent have an infrastructure deficit underpinning. Whether we're looking at agriculture where most of the agriculture on the continent is low value because we've got no electricity, no transportation or cold storage networks, or we're looking even at the technology industry where broadband you know, effectively is a product, you know, for wealthy people. And looking at areas like education, where through COVID, 
we found essentially that there's an increasing delta being created between the ability, you know, of the children of those that have to get a proper education because they have access to Wi-Fi. And that is a big differential for those who do not in public schools. Ultimately, we believe that solving Africa's infrastructure problems in a low carbon resilient approach. So basically also thinking about our climate footprint can be really, really critical to transforming this continent over this next decade. And without wanting to hug the conversation, um, you know, I'll share with you some of our thoughts about how you can create some kind of a bridge between the US markets and Africa around infrastructure. Thank, thank you very much, Bulaji. But I also want to stay with you just on this point of infrastructure, because you're absolutely right. I mean, we're talking about a 60 to $100 billion and potentially larger than that uh, infrastructure deficit that's been estimated um, for at least the next uh, 10 years. But, uh, you, you know, you, you, you kind of modestly swept over the fact that, and we've managed to crowd in, um, you know, domestic pension funds that have never invested in the asset class before, um, and we've created infrastructure as an investable uh, asset class, where we know globally and across the US, a lot of um, you know, institutional investors, particularly pension funds, are really grappling with that. I mean, what, what are the lessons learned there and how could that be scaled more? I think this is, this is really one of the most incredible opportunities that we all have. If we think about international investable capital, there's somewhere around a hot, $140 trillion of assets that sit in global asset managers across the world, probably 25% of that today generating negative yield. If you could directionally point just 0.25% of that towards this continent, in other words, a number around $300 billion, you and I could essentially finance all of the SDGs for the entire continent. This is how significant um, the opportunity for us is. And I do think there's an incredible role that development finance institutions can play with all of their history and all of their knowledge around infrastructure investing, particularly on the continent. And if we can create a platform where the DFIs essentially are the first you know, movers to a large extent, and you can list that platform in a very large liquid capital market, potentially a destination like London. You then essentially create a platform which has the ability to attract billions of dollars of capital. And to a large extent, you are going to create something you know, quite transformational around finance and infrastructure on this continent. And if we succeed in doing that, those infrastructure investments in turn will attract investments across a variety of sectors from agriculture to retail to manufacturing you know to mining to education to security even you know when you sit and you think about security across the rest of the world it's all about broadband and electricity it's all about listening devices it's all about cameras Without broadband and electricity to a large extent, weaponry, you know, is the only asset you have in security. So every single problem you look at on this continent really speaks to the infrastructure deficit. And if we can begin to finance that using capital markets very sustainably, then I think um, we will change this continent over the next decade. Uh, absolutely. Couldn't agree more, Balaji. And uh, to that point, the African Union's 5% um, infrastructure or institutional infrastructure investment agenda is playing a very big role in that, where the African Union, I think TDB were part of the initiative um, as well, convened uh, the leading African sovereign wealth funds and pension funds and entered into a pact where uh, there's a commitment now under a new framework called the Institutional Investor Public Partnership Framework, which is much more aligned with pension and sovereign funds, investment mandates and risk adjusted return criteria and approach uh, um, that the continental and for us from the continent would be putting at least 5% of our assets under management um, to demonstrate that goodwill and leadership 
uh, into these transactions and then go to the uh, global markets. And we were actually looking for 1%. Your, your, you know, your, your 0.25% is, is one number. We're looking for 1%. I think anything in between uh, would make a, a very significant impact. But I think another area where we have great opportunity to have uh, impact is in the agribusiness and the agri-food sector and food security related uh, markets on the continent for obvious reasons. And I'm just going to leave uh, Ndidi to tell us why that's such a good opportunity and introduce her business at the same time. Over to you, Ndidi. Thank you so much. And thank you, Africa.com, and to the entire leadership for this great opportunity. I work in the agriculture and food landscape um, and wear a number of hats. I'm the co-founder of Ace Foods. It's an agro-processing company, which was started 11 years ago to source locally, displace imports, and address malnutrition. I'm also the co-founder of Sahel Consulting Agriculture and Nutrition, which works across the continent, really implementing ecosystem solutions in the dairy, cassava, yam, maize, rice value chains, and also helping shape strategy. And my most recent uh, startup is called nourishingafrica.com, which is envisaged as a home for a million agribusinesses, transforming this $1 trillion landscape. I strongly believe that Africa can nourish itself and the world. We're naturally endowed for agricultural excellence and almost anything can grow on the African continent. And through the entire ecosystem, we recognize that there have been huge infrastructural and management challenges that have kept our sector from achieving its highest potential. But that said, 80% of the food eaten and grown in Africa is actually produced by African SMEs. And so they are the bedrock of this $1 trillion industry. Um, I have worked through the different hats I wear with a few uh, uh, US institutions and have strong ties to the United States. When we were starting uh, Ace Foods, we actually won the Africa Diaspora Marketplace Competition, which was actually organized by USAID about 10 years ago, 11 years ago. And it was actually a really great initiative because it was connecting Africans in the diaspora with Africans back on the continent to start businesses. And there was a matching fund. Um, I thought that was a great idea. And we're one of the few companies that have been selected and have proven that this model does work. We've also most recently partnered with the US Africa Development Foundation, which is run by City Glynn. Um, and Ace Food ha has benefited from some of the technical support from a range of US institutions. With Sahel Consulting, I work very, very closely with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and a number of catalytic projects on the continent and have also partnered with many US think tanks and uh, land grants institutions, research institutions. And the key finding for me is that we haven't created almost a level playing field when it comes to food between the US and Africa. Um, many US institutions still feel that Africa is a, should be a net importer of food from the US. Um, and you see that with some of my exchanges with some of the uh, pharma organizations. Um, and I think there needs to be a leveling um, around food. We want to see food from Africa also being accepted into the US, high quality food that meets US standards. We want to see a lot more trade between African um, businesses, not just for raw materials, but also for finished goods. We have a very strong diaspora network in the United States, and there is a huge demand for African food. Um, and then the second is that I would love to see a lot more uh, of the big development projects that USAID and other agencies are sponsoring on the continent, partnering with local institutions. Uh, we've seen a, a big desire to engage local institutions, but we haven't seen it at the level where local institutions are at the front, where, because that promotes sustainability, but also promotes um, ownership. And where there's ownership for some of these interventions, it survives beyond the life of the grant. And I'm sure many of you in the development community understand what I'm talking about. So I think there's a lot more that can be done there. And finally, I think there's a lot more partnership uh, between African SMEs and US SMEs. What we've seen in the US is that the US was built on the backbone of agriculture and agriculture is still such an important component of the US economy. And there's so much that can occur around knowledge transfer, best practices, and it can be both ways so that Africa is also sharing some of its own innovations and best practices. Through nourishingafrica.com, we currently have 600 active agribusinesses. 
producing innovative solutions to solve some of the deepest challenges we have around climate change, adaptation, um, productivity improvements, processing, and clearly we have some of the best food in the world. And changing that narrative, but also building bridges between African SMEs and their US counterparts will unlock the potential in this for both continents and also create tremendous value for all the actors across the value chain. So I'm excited to see what can come out of some of these conversations. Fantastic. And I just want to stay with you. I mean, it, just in terms of net import or, or, or who supplies what, I think the what is important here. And I think we, we are really transitioning to um, hopefully away from this uh, import substitution and um, conversation uh, versus beneficiation. I mean, clearly we're in the beneficiation space, we're industrializing, we've now got a framework within the African continental free trade area. Do, do we need to change our pitch just a little bit? Um, so what I'm saying is this, uh, you know, we still, I'll, I'll use Nigeria for example, Nigeria still imports quite a bit of soya bean and maize from the United States, mm -hmm. uh, where we could be self-sufficient and we should be self-sufficient, right? Mm -hmm. And so if we're looking at the importation of primary raw, uh, raw, uh, almost commodities, and the exportation of commodities from Africa to the United States, that narrative has to change. Where we should talk about value addition. So my company produces seasonings, spices, complementary food, and we have seen quite a bit of growing demand from US um, importers who want our finished product because it's high quality, but because African spices and Nigerian spices in particular are the best in the world. So changing that narrative where you're not exporting raw split ginger, but you're actually exporting jollof rice spice or pepper soup spice to the United States is the change in narrative that I'm talking about. And I agree with you. Um, and I want that narrative to change because we're still very much in the, still being viewed as a source for commodities, a source for cocoa beans and not chocolates, a source for uh, tea, raw tea and not uh, brands, uh, high quality brands from the African continent. Um, and so changing that narrative, increasing the standards and the quality and African entrepreneurs are rising to meet those standards and are producing products that are world-class. And I think that that receptivity on the other side has to also be there. Fantastic, thank you very much Ndidi. I, I saw uh, a, a little bit of swaying back and forth from Kuseni, so I'm gonna jump to uh, Kuseni who, who, who uh, knows and leads uh, one of the leading retailers in the continent just to get not only your views on the the, the the overall question but also to respond in part to some of Indidi's comments that we were just talking about that sort of changing the narrative and and, and really balancing the supply and the demand related opportunity over to you Kuseni. Thank you very much Hubert and thanks to Teresa and the Africa.com team for hosting such an important uh, opportunity for us to discuss um, Africa's future. I'd like to start by saying that the post-COVID environment provides an excellent and golden opportunity for Africa to reset its relationships uh, with the United States in general, but in particular business and investment relationships. I think that Africa can only recover from the ashes of COVID by leveraging its very unique and strategic relationship with the United States. In, the, in a country like South Africa, for example, US companies account for 10% of GDP and they employ over half a million people. And as ambassador, as US Assistant Secretary of State, Ambassador Thibault Nagy said earlier on, US companies employ locals, they don't bring experts as other countries do. And as MassMart, we are owned by Walmart. Walmart owns 53% of our business and we are very proud to have that kind of linkage with the world's leading retailer. We employ 48,000 people across 13 countries in Africa. We generate 93 billion rand in revenue each year, and we're looking at growing that. We're very passionate and committed to growing our footprint in Africa. We see Africa as our home. We want to partner with local suppliers in response to this point. It's something that's very close to our heart in every market where we where we operate, we first look at local suppliers and where we can find them, we partner with them. We have a three-pronged approach to relationships with suppliers. Here in South Africa, we have a supplier development program. The first uh, uh, objective in terms of our relationship with suppliers is to maximize local sourcing. 
from local suppliers. The second objective is to import substitute, reduce the value and volume of goods that we export from outside the market where we trade. And thirdly, is to assist those suppliers that have partnered with us, who have trusted us to be able to export their products to the global market. We, we are fortunate in being part of Walmart. Walmart operates 28 countries around the world, and we're working very closely with Bentonville in terms of opening up opportunities for African suppliers. In October last year, for example, we hosted buyers from Walmart's global sourcing uh, team in Bentonville. They came to South Africa to meet with 18 of our local suppliers. Out of those meetings, seven suppliers were earmarked as having products that Walmart is interested in. And we were very pleasantly surprised uh, when one of the suppliers that is part of our supply development fund, a company called Glenart, they manufacture Christmas crackers and the Walmart buyers, they actually like their product to the extent that now their product is listed in 800 stores in Walmart US, which is much more than the number of stores that we have as mass marts in Africa. We've got 420 stores. By just partnering with us, now they've managed to access a much wider universe. And that's where we see ourselves being a real partner of choice and really executing on our philosophy of shared value uh, in our relationships with suppliers, with local communities, with regulators, uh, with, with our associates, the 48,000 associates that we employ, 95% of all our associates in, across all countries are local talent. We spend time when we go into a new market in investing in the development of local talent because we don't believe in bringing experts in markets because that's, that's not sustainable. When it comes to categories such as fresh foods, for example, around 98% of the fresh food that you find in our stores in Ghana in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Nigeria, a source from local suppliers. It is our strategic objective to do that. We believe it makes strategic business sense. It simplifies the value chains. It lowers the cost of logistics. It, it uh, resolves some of the issues around infrastructure that Admasu was talking about earlier on and clearing of ports, inefficiencies in ports. So we have had to innovate to think strategically and think in terms of the long term. So we're really very excited with the opportunities that are there. We look forward to continuing to make sure that we are a partner of choice and we want to reset the approach to small and medium enterprises. If you look at countries like Austria and Switzerland and Germany, they've got small and medium enterprises that are part of the global supply chains of blue chip Wall Street companies, Future 100 companies. I think African manufacturers and SMEs have got to move beyond looking just at the local opportunities or the national opportunities. We need to start thinking about the globalization of the footprints of African SMMEs. Look at a country like South Korea, which is as small as South Africa, but there is no country in the world that doesn't have a Samsung product, an LG product from South Korea. As part of rebuilding from COVID, we need a fresh and creative approach to African industrial policy, to manufacturing strategies, that start thinking, that start making Africans to think and aim to scale up, to be able to produce products for 7.7 .7 billion people in the world, not just the 1.2 billion people, because we constrain ourselves when we look at that. And we also need to think about innovation. We have to think about the fourth industrial revolution, because the world is moving ahead. We cannot be spectators in those industries which are shaping the future of global commerce. We need to create the right ecosystems so that we can have our own African Alibabas, our own African Googles, Facebooks, and, and scalable ICT ventures, not just localized subscale entities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christina. I think your, your words are resonating not only with our, our, our colleagues in the US administration, but also your fellow, fellow panelists and SMEs are invigorated, hopefully, um, across, across the continent. And I think this, this the way that we approach the African continental free trade area, every time we engage with heads of state in this conversation, we make very clear that you know it's transformative and we completely support um, the, 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 the acceleration and the implementation of that agenda um, to improve intra-African trade from the, the 14 or 16 percent to uh, a much more significant uh, percentage and number. But you know our real focus um, in addition to that is to be able to leverage that platform to increase our 
less than sort of 2% share of, of, of global trade. So absolutely to your point, we certainly have to appreciate not only what the African continental free trade area is doing for us, which is to say, if I'm in Ghana, my market is not just Ghana, my market is the entire continent. But I think we just need to just uh, tack on to that. You know, if you're sitting in Nigeria, your market is not just the entire continent, it's the globe. And I think the more we can create that market infrastructure to accomplish that, and then, as you say, digital plays a critical role. So I'm going to turn to E now because I've heard certain people describe him as Africa's Zuckerberg. So um, let's let, let's hear from Africa's Zuckerberg. Over to you, E. <laughs> um, my, my name is uh, Iolua Boeji, um, as was earlier mentioned. And for the last 10 years, um, I've been building uh, technology companies across the continent and now investing in them. Um, um, I spent... Um, uh, qu quite a bit of time building two of the fastest growing companies on the continent, Andela, um, which was uh, basically focused on helping um, talented young people in Africa to be able to um, um, become um, 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 software engineers who work with global companies from all over the world while they remain right here in Africa. Um, and then afterwards, I founded Flutterwave, which helps global US companies in particular um, to build um, businesses, um, uh, to, to build businesses in across Africa by being able to uh, accept payments. Uh, we work with brands like Netflix, Uber, helping them accept different African payment methods, um, as well as helping local businesses accept global payment methods from all over the world. Um, I think um, um, from my perspective, um, a big part of the collaboration that, that folks like me have enjoyed with the US over the last um, 10 years has really been um, in the strength um, of our diaspora. Um, and it's something that I consistently say that um, Africa in particular has um, 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 one gift to give the world in reality, and that is its human capital. Um, while, while everybody tends to focus on natural resources uh, and, and other elements, um, I think Africa's human capital is, is e extremely um, 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 beautiful and is the major, uh, would I say, um, contribution uh, to our partnership with the United States. Um, as you know, uh, um, Nigerians in the United States do comprise uh, some of the best educated um, and are eager to contribute to national development. And it's what has influenced kind of my path now with Future Africa, where what we do is we work with um, diaspora from all over the world, particularly in the US, um, as a US registered um, uh, securities and exchange uh, commissions exempt company to accept payments, um, um, investments from, from, from these um, um, investors to invest in African uh, innovators that are helping turn Africa's challenges into global business opportunities. Um, over the last quarter, in partnership with US institutional funds, uh, we've raised over a million dollars for early stage companies in Africa. Uh, and we've also backed um, about 15 companies um, over, over the last uh, uh, quarter alone. Uh, but over the last five years, um, uh, we've backed about 32 companies. Uh, those companies have gone on to raise $300 million, mostly from the US, um, and then also gone on to, uh, uh, they're, they're, they're worth uh, a, a total of $1.2 billion. And um, they've created about 12,000 jobs since they started. So I think the beauty of our partnership with the United States has been in our ability for our diaspora to transfer not just financial capital, but social capital, um, as well as um, human capital from the point of view of technology and knowledge transfer to the local populace. Um, so I think that's something that we need to strengthen in a very strategic way. Uh, and some of the ways that we, we've thought about strengthening it is in really thinking about what can the US contribute to Africa and making Africa a technology powerhouse in the digital economy. Um, and I spe specifically speak to the Nigerian experience. And when you look at the World Bank's report on the digital economy key indicators, what you will find is that we have a bunch of um, indicators. So at the bottom, you have um, digital infrastructure and digital platforms, uh, digital infrastructure, things like power, things like internet, um, things like um, um, you know, roads, if you can think about those as part of enabling um, logistics for the digital economy and many other things. On the other hand, with digital platforms, you have data, um, you have um, identity, 
and many other things that you need. Around, layered on top of that, you have digital financial services. And then on top of that, you have digital um, skills and digital entrepreneurship that are enabled by digital financial services. Now, what, 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 we're, what we're looking for more support on, and where I think there's a strategic um, um, imperative for the US to partner, uh, especially given there is the China option, is in helping the, the government as well as business owners to be able to solidify uh, Africa's digital infrastructure um, and digital uh, uh, um, and platforms. And there's a lot of work going on there. If you, uh, the Facebook and, and Google have both launched C subsea cable projects uh, into Africa. And there are a lot of US companies that are currently uh, through the Power Africa program working on solar to make sure that despite the challenges with the grid, we can have centralized power uh, across the continent. So the right steps are being made, but I think it's important to accelerate some of those moves and work much closer in partnership with local entrepreneurs to be able to en enable it. Uh, the second thing uh, is really, you know, how can you create um, a, a safe space, a safe policy space for startups? Uh, because um, one of the challenges that startups have faced, quite frankly, is, is um, the fact that, you know, um, the, the political atmosphere does dictate the policy, um, as opposed to the policy uh, to some extent being recommended by experts. And it's gonna take a long time to change that. So how do you create a safe space um, for, for, for young people, particularly those in the technology space, to create a cluster where they can, they can, they can be enabled? Um, and, and I think that's really uh, going to have to come through uh, free trade zones and charter cities across the African continent. You can create these cluster spaces um, that can attract talented young people, human capital, and that can export um, human capital to the rest of the world, particularly to large US companies in the area of, for example, machine learning, training, uh, or AI, um, and, and things like that, where there's a natural partnership between US technology companies and African talent. Um, which, is, which is currently budding, but could be encouraged. And then I think finally, uh, um, there's a real conversation uh, to be had about the laws um, and, and, and formation. And I think it's a conversation uh, to be had on both sides, as well as a conversation where the US government can play a huge role in educating our governments about what is required. Today, the vast majority of successful technology companies, including two of the ones that I founded, are, are Delaware companies. They're US companies, but they have... Uh, all their operations in Africa. I think that's a good start, but I think that's not sufficient. And over time, um, those companies should, com successful African companies should be able to domicile um, in, in Nigeria. Um, and, and that's gonna be a function of uh, educating and, and supporting efforts uh, to create the right kind of structures in Africa that are comfortable for US investors to be able to uh, invest uh, because it's not sustainable for, um, for Africa to, to continue to do that. And then I would like to also on the policy angle, also echo Mr. Bologi's point about unlocking local capital. One of the things that, that we're trying to do is to get the president to sign the new BOFIA Act, which would allow banks to unlock at least 10% of uh, their assets uh, to invest in up to 40% uh, of commitments in a venture capital firm. I think when that's done, we're going to see us unlock more more local capital. And then most importantly, um, just continuing to harp on the need uh, for the politicians and leaders of Nigeria to abide by the rule of law. Um, one of the issues consuming the tech community- Fantastic, uh, Ii, Ii, if we can come back to you in the, in, in the next sort of parting part round, but e excellent, excellent um, suggestions. And I, I certainly think it's going to be boosted by the fact that the African continental free trade areas e-commerce protocol, which was, um, slated to be negotiated in 2022 uh, has now been accelerated on the back of private sector um, engagement to now take place in 2021. So there's a real opportunity um, to leverage the African continental free trade area and the e-commerce and the digital and e-trade uh, protocol to accomplish um, a, number of those, a number of those different uh, issues. Um, I'm now going to turn to um, our dear sister, Nara Sackle, to just tell us a little bit about her story and share her views, um, you know, in this particular subject. I mean, you've got a great and interesting model and market. Um, over to you, Nara Sackle. Hi, thank you so much. So as a Ghanaian, so far, I have to take issue with one point from today's panel. Ndidi, your view that Nigerian spices are the best. Um, 
I do not think is true, but thank you for your views and thank you to Africa.com for um, including my voice. So from I'm from the shea butter industry. Uh, that's about over a, a billion dollar industry, primarily in the form of raw shea butter, which increases dramatically, uh, dramatically rather, when considered as kind of a pro rata portion of consumer finished goods, which I think um, is, is an interesting perspective, especially when, when considering Bolaji's point on infrastructure being a root issue in Africa, that shea butter on its own is 1 billion, but thinking about shea butter in soaps and lotions and shampoos, obviously that, that kind of explodes really, really rapidly. Um, so that's uh, on the economic side of things. In terms of like the impact of shea butter on the continent, that's something that about 16 million women across Sub-Saharan Africa use to support their, their, their families and their communities. And Mother Shea Limited, of which I am the CEO, is a, a small and growing SME within that. So we are a vertically integrated shea butter manufacturer with about 50 employees in Ghana. Started with relatively modest roots from 50 pounds in 2000 to hundreds of tons today. My mother, the, the kind of legacy roots of the company was president of the Global Shea Alliance. So really involved in the Shea space and sustainability. And we consider the, the quality of our products and the sustainability of our products, as well as our social impact, really key integral pieces to, to facilitate that trade between Ghana and the US. So we partner with about 10,000 women in Northern Ghana, provide them with training, buy nuts from them, make shea butter in Ghana, and then ship that shea butter to the US primarily. And I think that one key differentiator between us and other companies is that oftentimes shea nuts are purchased from the continent and then shipped to Europe where they are then refined. And that, because of the yields between shea nuts and shea butter often leads to about two thirds waste getting transported. So that is kind of a, a quick overview about us thinking about the specifics of our, our relationship with, with the US. Mm -hmm. First off, we are so grateful to be a recipient of a, a US ADF grant. So thank you CD and the entire ADF team. Beyond that, the shea butter that we ship from Ghana to the US gets used either in finished goods or directly to consumer or to in B2B trade. So on the finished goods side, we have two brands. One is called Eugenia Shea, which is sold in Anthropology, Urban Outfitters, and Macy's. And then the second one is kind of an affordable luxury product that's sold in Target. Then we also sell both, both lines through our uh, D2C website. And then as I mentioned previously, B2B to brands and distributors. And then Finally, when I think about kind of business opportunities and challenges with, with doing trade with the US, I think the infodemic that you mentioned earlier is not just a risk of doing business, but there's also kind of a dual out, duality of perception regarding African products. And on the one hand, you know, African products are sometimes perceived as low quality products to be avoided at all costs, which is obviously problematic. On the other hand, they are perceived as, again, unfortunately, low quality products that are to be purchased as a form of charity. And I think that our company, as well as it sounds like many SMEs, both in our space and other spaces, aim to dispel those myths by providing high quality products, in our case, moisturizers, that are effective and also have purpose. So we are a social enterprise rather than a charity. Um, okay. Wonderful. And I think that's the narrative. That's absolutely the narrative in terms of the, I think, as the um, administration and the heads of the agencies in the last panel mentioned, there is this important um, transition from the aid conversation to the trade conversation where we sit. It's, it's very much um, transitioning much more to from aid to trade to institutional investment and then reversing that back into portfolio companies that have a, you know, a co-investment. And, and, and buy and supply uh, relationship between um, the continent uh, uh, and the US. I'm mindful of time. I, I'd very much like you to, in 30 seconds, each of you, let's show how, how, how sort of agile and dynamic we can be. In, in 30 seconds, just sort of give us one um, top priority business partnership proposal that the audience and the US administration can take away that 
you know, you would prioritize and recommend and get involved with um, as an outcome from this particular di uh, dialogue and taking advantage of this particular moment of stronger and, 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 and sort of more forward leaning US uh, Africa uh, business partnerships. Your 30 seconds, Admasu. Uh, we have been supporting U.S. investment in Africa. We've been doing that with African capital and global capital. Uh, we think we can do much more if U.S. capital comes to the party better. Uh, we do work very closely with U.S. Exim, U.S. Aid, Citibank, and the like, but we think uh, they can do more with us if the, the U.S. government reaches out and also embraces African financial institutions so that we can also do more on the ground here in Africa with American businesses. Mm -hmm. I have several US clients who uh, were in difficult situations and they had no bank to support them. And we did that because we believed in them. But uh, in many cases, uh, for a multilateral to do that, you need to have US capital in you in order to, to, to step out and do that. So I, I just think there's a lot more the US can do to, to, to partner with African financial institutions. But Fantastic. And I'm sure that you will create that pipeline. And I'm now going to quickly go to Ndidi. And we're just going to go around this very, very quickly. 30 seconds. I'm going to be a bit tight on that. Clock's ticking. Thank you. I would like to, yes, thank you. I would like to see a scaling of Africa diaspora food initiatives, primarily focused on changing the narrative about African food and also creating very easy opportunities for African processed and packaged food to be sold in the US. Thank Building you very much. On, sorry, thank you. Oh, no, no, perfect. Wonderful. So, E, over to you for your 30 seconds. Yeah, I think um, there is an opportunity for uh, the US government to collaborate with the technology community to build um, specialized economic zone or free trade zones um, for the technology cluster. It's going to solve a lot of problems, including safeguarding talent. Um, enabling capital importation, uh, enabling the development and progress of technology with African talent, Fantastic. and ultimately getting a foothold on, on the rest of the Africa future. Well received. Na Sako, over to you. All right. Incentivizing U.S. organizations to do business with African ones by uh, an African certification program uh, similar to like women-owned businesses or minority-owned businesses. Thanks. Nice and succinct. Thank you. Kuseni? There is an opportunity for the U.S. to share its playbook on global competitiveness with African businesses so that African businesses can produce world-class quality products that can play a very leading and prominent role across the entire world, not just between Africa and the USA, but looking at 7.7 .7 billion people in the world. Thank you very much. And to bookend us, Bulaji. The last word the is yours. The U.S.'s pension funds and institutional capital have significant excess capital haunting for yield. Um, Africa's infrastructure and Africa's development needs literally can provide an incredible home and opportunity. And I think that the US government agencies and development finance institutions have a critical role to play in creating that bridge. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's a beautiful bridge because not only can US pension funds co-invest in Africa, but on the continent, we also have international allocations and we can also co-invest um, with the US-based pension funds into the US. Over to you, Tricia. Thank you, everybody. Excellent discussion. Hubert, thank you very much for moderating this conversation. Mm -hmm. And um, I want to just thank all of the panelists on this. And this is the moment when we should all be on stage taking a picture together. Mm -hmm. And I should be giving you a little gift of some kind to uh, remember and acknowledge your, your effort. So seeing as we can't do that, then um, today I would like to let you know that Africa.com will be making a contribution in your individual names to the Student Sponsorship Program of South Africa an organization that is making a huge difference in building the pipeline of leadership for that country. So um, that will be our gift in honor of the contributions that you've made to this session. Um, I'd like to acknowledge one more time um, our sponsors and thank you to General Electric, to Bank of America and to Covington for your contributions making this event happen. All right, and I think that this was an excellent panel. Again, critical to have two-way conversation 
you've provided a number of very valuable perspectives. I think that some of the ambassadors who are coming up on the next panel have been here to hear your remarks. And I certainly know that the agency heads have done so. So let's, so let's just talk about where we are in our um, summit today. We started off today by hearing from the Assistant Secretary um, of State for African Affairs, Tibor Naj, and the Chair of the President's Advisory Council on Doing Business in Africa, and the Head of Sub-Saharan Africa for Bank of America, who provided a macro perspective on the relations between US and Africa and the importance of trade and business in that relationship. Our second panel focused on the agency heads. We heard from the Africa heads of USAID, the Development Finance Corporation, the African Development Finance Corporation, from um, Export Import Bank, and from the newly established Prosper Africa, a new entity that has been created to help coordinate and serve African businesses as they seek to navigate the complexities of the US government. The last panel gave us some perspective so that this was a dialogue. We heard from senior executives in Africa who have done business with the United States and we got their policy recommendations, particularly at the end, a very sharp 30 second succinct set of recommendations as to what they think can be done to expand and enhance the relationships that have been important to them in building their respective businesses. And that brings us to our last panel of the day, panel four. This panel is a panel of US ambassadors to key countries for commerce between the United States and the African continent. What we want to do now is hear their perspectives on their experiences in dealing with African businesses and guidance for those um, who seek to do business on the ground in each one of their respective countries. We have for this panel, a fantastic moderator. We have Zane Virgi, who is a former CNN anchor and correspondent and a communications entrepreneur who has worked across the African continent, though she called Kenya home. And she has had an opportunity to meet with many of these sorts of leaders and heads of state and understand the very critical flows that occur between the US and Africa, not only in terms of business, but in terms of important and critical policy issues that define relationships. So Zane Virgi, can I, I'm gonna turn this over to your able hands to moderate this panel. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Teresa. Great to be here. Hello and welcome everyone to the fourth and final panel of this virtual summit, Africa's portal to doing business with the United States. So as we say in Swahili, karibuni to all of you, welcome. I'm Zane Virgi and so honored, Teresa and, and the whole team to moderate this panel of five US ambassadors to key countries in Africa for business, investment and trade. We've got Angola, Ghana, Kenya, where I'm from, not that I'm biased at all, uh, Nigeria and South Africa. In this session, we're going to have a great opportunity to hear directly from those who represent the US government on the ground throughout Africa and really try and, and appreciate the nuanced ways in which the US government engages with the business community in these five key markets. Given our current times and the fact that U.S. embassies are closed at this time, it's especially important for us to make connections between the ambassadors and the local business communities. So that's really what this panel is all about. That's, that's what we want to do today. From our earlier calls, by the way, with the ambassadors, uh, they, they really hope that you do take advantage of this conversation and you do reach out to the economic or commercial services uh, offices that are in each of their embassies and consulates and, 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 and make the most we can virtually out of this. If you want to learn any more about the programs discussed today, please write to Prosper Africa. It's the newly created agency of the US government that coordinates across 17 agencies that do business with Africa. So again, their contact details are shown uh, on the screen here and uh, we'll make them available as well after the program. So if you want to connect, connect with any of the embassies who will be speaking now on our panel, their contact information is available at usembassy.gov. Okay, great. So I'd just like to jump in here and start talking to each of the ambassadors that we have here individually. I really want this to be more of a conversation and just, you know, I really want to get a, a, both a personal sense 
of what it's like doing business and, and advocating for business in your countries and regions in Africa, as well as some of the success stories that you've had and, and some of the obstacles that you've dealt with and had to overcome. So I would like to start first with Ambassador Nina Marie Feit, who serves in Angola. Thank you so much for being with us. It's, it's a pleasure. I, let me start by asking you first, what is the most exciting part about doing business in Africa for you? Um, well, Zane, thank you. And thanks everybody for being here. But in general, what is exciting about doing business in Africa, I think, is the fact that, um, on, for example, in Angola, you have an oil industry that's very mature, that's been here for almost 70 years. So it's well developed, it's, it's cutting edge it as much as it can be. And it has you know, uh, trained and nurtured a whole generation of Angolans um, uh, to become professionals. At the same time you have, because um, as other panels have mentioned in earlier uh, programs, we've got such a youthful population in all of Africa. So we've got such creativity and entrepreneurship. And I think for us, particularly you know, through the embassy programs, we, this past year, in fact, some of it was virtual, but we did a who wants to be an entrepreneur program where we brought in speakers. We helped people develop their business plans, helped Angolans develop their business plans. And so I think being um, on the ground to see that kind of creativity blossom is really exciting. That's a, that sounds awesome. Who wants to be an, an entrepreneur? I like that. Uh, give us an idea of, of the success stories you've had. Like, you know, is there one that, re, other than that one, that really stands out in your mind uh, and explain why it worked? Um, we've had a couple different um, success stories, but let me tell you about one, which is with an American company that has recently signed an agreement with the government of Angola for the largest solar energy project in sub-Saharan Africa, which is gonna be about 385 megawatts. The amazing part about this um, was that, and we had a, a Power Africa um, technician embedded in the Angolan Ministry of um, Energy and Water. And one of the things that we learned through his working with the Angolans to strengthen the regulations um, was that there was nothing in the books, you know, because to deal with a private producer selling um, renewable energy to the government. There was all sorts of rules for selling fossil fuel energy, but nothing on renewable energy. And so that was one of the things that we were able, you know, it was identified first as a challenge. It was through our work um, and a lot of discussions that we had with the government, with various sectors, with the company, that we were able to then find another way to make this happen. It, it became a big project that had financing from different countries um, and companies and sourcing and not just American. And so it was a very collaborative project, which is also part of the success, but it required a lot of, um, just a lot of legwork on the embassy's part, just as in my colleagues all do in their embassies of talking to ministers, talking to technicians, talking to people along the way to identify obstacles and figure out how we could get, um, we can uh, overcome those obstacles. Right. Well, th that's a great example. How, how do you think that African businesses uh, can tap the resources of the US government on the ground uh, you're, you're in Angola and elsewhere more effectively perhaps than we might already be doing? Um, one thing that we use a lot, we have two business chambers here. We have an American Chamber of Commerce in Angola and we have a US Angola Chamber of Commerce. And we try and partner with these organizations as much as we can to offer programming. So even during this period of COVID, for example, uh, about a month ago, we did a program with Exim Bank to explain how companies can partner with US companies to access um, Exim Bank credit because there's a $4 billion um, credit line with Exim and the Ministry of Finance in Angola. Some of the other things that we've worked on um, are uh, developing um, a, a workshop to uh, teach and explain American standards to Angolan companies. And then I think one of the things um, our group has been really successful in, um, the last, in 2019, which was a much more normal year, we had a trade delegation of over 100 Angolan companies, which mm -hmm. we took to the United States. This was around the oil and gas industry. 
And with that group, we work with them ahead of time, kind of doing that, here is how Americans do business 101. And, you know, it's the stay in touch. Even if you don't have an answer for them, stay in touch, because if they don't hear from you, they think you're not interested. And so just trying to um, coach the, the companies through the cultural uh, differences that exist between the two countries, and then also doing matchmaking. You know, we put them in touch with American companies. American companies look to us to help vet Angolan companies and vice versa. Last question, Ambassador. What would you say has been your biggest challenge uh, in the work that you try to do when it comes to uh, U.S. investment and promoting business uh, in Africa? And, and how did you overcome it? And is there an opportunity perhaps in that challenge that we could take away that would be beneficial for both of us? So listen, I got to talk about the elephant in the room. Angola has been known as a country with a lot of corruption. And you have a current president, uh, Jean Lorenzo, who is doing his best to combat corruption. We, as, a, as, as an embassy, as a US government, are also supporting that through training and capacity building. But you know that's something that companies are reluctant. But in, at the same time, things have changed here. Things are starting to, um, you know, he has made considerable strides. And so I think part of our biggest challenge is also educating people. Um, explaining the risks, making sure that people have the, a true understanding of what they're coming into when they come here, and then also working with the Angolans to say, hey, look, at these are some of the low-hanging fruit that if you can make this business process a little easier, that will make things more, um, uh, less risk, uh, risky for American companies coming in. And so it's a work in progress. I don't want to say we've overcome the challenge, but I think we've made a lot of progress. Fair enough. Thank you for your frankness, uh, Ambassador Fight. Uh, let's bring into the conversation Ambassador Stephanie Sullivan uh, from Ghana. Uh, Ambassador Sullivan, I, I have to ask you this first question, which is really important to doing business in, in Ghana and, um, and elsewhere on the continent. Ghanaian jollof or Nigerian jollof? I was hoping you would raise that question. <laughs> Obviously, Ghanaian. <laughs> Yeah, you have to politically navigate these waters appropriately before I can get to the next <laughs> question. <laughs> okay, good. Um, well, how have you been able to navigate the, the business uh, landscape and just keeping the train moving given COVID? Um, well, I think uh, Ghana has a very developed IT infrastructure and um, a lot of people were very comfortable pivoting to a virtual uh, existence. And um, we continued our outreach to the local business community and even the small and medium sized um, entrepreneurs who had been through our Academy for Women Entrepreneur Program um, to help them stay connected and share best practices and um, let them know that as uh, Ambassador Fight pointed out, we are still open for business. We're just not uh, physically there in the way we used to be. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit because I know there have been uh, some pretty good, I think, uh, virtual trade missions, right, that, uh, that you've pursued and uh, pretty successful video conferences bringing different parties together. Just talk a little bit about that. Has that been more effective than a, an actual in-person one, equally as effective, or did you lose something by doing that? Um, well, I think it's a mixed bag. Um, fundamentally, the business environment is about relationships. Um, right. And I think people who already had existing relationships in real life uh, found it a bit easier to pivot. But as the whole world got used to dealing um, with Zoom and these other platforms, uh, I think that in-person connection became less important than it used to be. And so that, I think, has enabled things to accelerate in a way. Like Nobody needs to get a visa. Nobody needs to get their yellow fever shot. Uh, you can just um, jump in and have um, a kind of a more effective use of time uh, from either side of the ocean. You mentioned uh, women and girls projects also that uh, you focused on. How much is, is gender on, on, in Ghana and in, in, the, in the entire region a priority uh, for the U.S. government in terms of investing in, in, in women-led businesses or building skills and advocacy work type of stuff? Uh, what, what are you doing in that space? Sure, it's, it's a huge priority. Um, uh, presidential advisor Ivanka Trump launched the Global 
uh, Women's Development Prosperity Initiative um, about 18 months ago in Abidjan. Um, the AWE program, the Academy for Women Entrepreneurs, is part of that. Um, we've already heard in previous panels how the African Development Foundation is uh, providing facilities for some of these alumni uh, who's, you know, it's about capacity building and helping people. What, what really warms my heart as a former Peace Corps volunteer is the capacity building uh, and helping uh, people, communities, companies, nations reach their full potential. And one of the things that really drives me, particularly about the um, new approach with Prosper Africa, is I first came to an African country in 1980, and I don't want to be having the same conversations, if I'm still alive in 40 years, uh, that we've been having about development. So something has to change. And I think the, the focus on the business to business uh, and um, providing the facilities to have some of these small and medium companies get help them get from good to great. Uh, Ambassador Fight mentioned the XM facility. There's a similar uh, 300 million XM facility um, agreement between US XM and Ghana XM. Uh, and we're looking forward to seeing those companies that will be the beneficiaries uh, selected in a very um, objective and nonpartisan manner um, based on their potential for creating employment. Uh, we've heard about the youth bulge, and, and that's a serious, not just economic issue, um, but a potential security issue. So it's right. a double-edged sword of, um, you know, yeah. Yeah. crisis and opportunity. <laughs> there always is that double-edged sword, depending on how we weight it. Um, so uh, one question here, because um, what has changed is that we have this thing called the Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, um, right? So how is the U.S. government, how are you? looking at future potential investment on the continent, uh, bearing in mind the context in which we're also beginning to operate within the continent. Uh, I don't know what you mean by the context, if you're talking about COVID or no, no, this no, larger trade. trade agreement, oh, yeah. I think it's great. I mean, I, I think there was some uh, misinformation out there that the US was not enthusiastic about um, the continental free trade area. We're, 100% enthusiastic. We want to see this larger trading block that will be more attractive to um, U.S. engagement in the business sense. And uh, we don't, we want to see those barriers come down, um, you know, but it's a building process and, 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 and you've got the sub-regional economic organizations. Right. Uh, you've got trucks stuck for days at the border, even within an economic organization. And so there's a lot of work to be done, but we have, um, been engaging with the new secretariat that's based in Accra, uh, and we're looking at ways that we can help um, uh, amplify and uh, help Americans understand what the opportunities are there, because um, it's really a potential game changer. Awesome. Yeah, thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Ambassador Kyle McCarter uh, in Kenya to say a few words here, and you know, it's my home country, uh, Ambassador McCarter. So let me start by saying Jambo, Habarigani. I'm missing having a cold Tusker and Tangawizi <laughs> every evening. <laughs> now that I've got that out of the way, uh, what are the US's priorities in Kenya when it comes to investment? We are all hands on deck with this new free trade agreement. Everyone is focused on this. This was, uh, this was, an, uh, this was a decision between President Kenyatta and President Trump that this should happen um, and we are doing everything we can to, to make it happen. It's not gonna be easy. Uh, we expect it's gonna take some time, but uh, we, are, we are convinced that uh, we have chosen the, the, the right partner to establish a free trade agreement that can be used as a model for the rest of Africa. And, uh, and people are excited about it. They're really excited about it. I, I was I was at I was at the butcher shop just this weekend, and and, and a guy stops me as he's, you know, he's, he's grabbing his sack of uh, uh, meat and says, "You've got to get this done." And I said, "Why?" He said, "Because he said he said you're he said we need rules for the game that right. we can all abide by." And uh, and and what he's talking about is in contrast the brown envelope kind of deals that have been going on for so long uh, across Africa. And, and people are tired of it and, and they want to compete uh, on, a, on a level playing field. 
And so that's why I think that's why people are excited. Uh, they're, they, they, uh, I, I, you know, I always say that we want to go from aid to trade and, and that's true in Kenya as well. Yeah. Uh, they don't want to be, uh, dependent upon for just foreign aid. They want to be self-reliant and I carry, and I carry with me in, in my notebook, uh, this list of $12 billion of investment that uh, that people are looking at, you know, bringing to Kenya, and uh, it encourages them. And so uh, right. we are, like I said, we are. Everyone in our embassy is focused on uh, making this free trade agreement happen. You mentioned uh, the butcher shop and the conversation you had. I'm wondering if it was Gilani's and Gigiri yeah. right next to the embassy. Was it? Was it that one? <laughs> no, no, no. We're actually uh, in the Valley, but uh, it's in the Valley. <laughs> it was but, valley. Uh, okay, okay. I know right. what you're talking about. Okay, uh, just had to clarify because uh, you know they're friends. Um, I uh, I wanted to ask you where do you see the biggest growth area in Kenya in terms of uh, investment opportunities for for Americans we, and Kenyans to engage. We are focusing on. Any business sector, any industry that can help uh, the United States be less dependent upon China, uh, any and, and make and help Kenya be less dependent on China. Now, the, the, the balance of trade is one to one with the United States and Kenya right now. It's just not big enough, but it's 34 to one with China. And so uh, we we want we want to help, we want to help them out as well. So we are looking at pharmaceutical manufacturing uh, as one. Uh, we've got uh, the uh, largest uh, manufacturer of generics uh, that has uh, is looking at coming here uh, and, and setting up shop. Uh, we we are looking at a refinery. We're looking at uh, uh, numerous uh, textile manufacturers. And, um, and so it's, um, like I said, anything where there can be a, a, a kind of a win, 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 a win for both of us, but a win to keep us from, uh, keep both of us from being dependent upon China. I, I also think that uh, tourism, right? It's, it's one of our, our, our main staples for, on the economy. And I think that the, the US government and, and investment has really come in quite significantly recently, right? To kind of give tourism in Kenya a shot in the arm. That's right. We, we have been focusing on the conservancies um, and um, the, uh, the conservancies, you, you know, that's about 18% of the economy and it's been hit hard and we, and we are trying to get them back quicker than uh, anyone in, in Africa. So we, we're in a way competing against Tanzania. And so uh, we're trying to get people back as quick as possible. You know, we're very fortunate that COVID has not hit um, most of Africa, we, you know, South Africa has had, had some real challenges, but uh, I'll say in Kenya, we, we've had very few deaths, a fraction of the deaths for, to COVID that we were uh, ex expected to have. And yeah. so we have come out of this a little quicker than anyone thought. And uh, it's, it's, it's made a, a safer environment for tourists. And so uh, we're, we're trying to get them Get that back, that industry back as soon as as soon as possible because it, it's hurt a lot of people. Yeah. But uh, we are <laughs> investing in the the, uh, the the conservancies and in uh, in in, in training uh, training people while they wait for people to come back, making them much more valuable to the industry. Ambassador, just one more, um, please, uh, if you don't, if you don't mind here, um, on um, when it when it comes to Kenya and and Kenyan businesses, how can they access the resources that the the embassy provides, or the U.S. government provides? What's what, what's the one thing that you would point us to? Well, I think uh, you know one one of the things that our embassy has done well is they have develop this deal team uh, structure. And, uh, and, that's, and it's something that uh, other, other embassies have been encouraged to do, but this, uh, we try to use every resource we have, we have at post. I, and and, and no, one, uh, no one is excused from being part of the deal. Uh, if, it's a, if, it's, if it's a snag politically, uh, we're, we're going to, we're going to go after it. If it's, uh, if it's, uh, it's capital, 
you know, our FCS folks are going to, they're going to look for it. And, uh, and everyone is obligated to make these deals work. And so I think, th I think this is where Prosper Asper Africa comes in to kind of coordinate all of those resources and uh, make sure that they're working together and, and, and not against one another. And, um, and I think uh, just being, um, uh, being accessible, being quick to respond, uh, you know, we, in this world, we've got to be much more nimble. We, yeah, we've we've got to be quick and we've got to be quicker than, than the people we're competing against. And absolutely. so uh, I would say, uh, you know, that Prosper Africa is there for that. And, uh, and I will say that uh, the same list that I carry around is one that's driven by them and followed up by us. And, uh, and, and we're, doing, we're trying our best to bring these across the finish line uh, for you. the prosperity of both the United States and Kenya. Awesome. Asante Sana, Ambassador. Uh, we'll come back again, uh, <laughs> Karibu, shortly. Uh, let's uh, let's uh, bring in Ambassador Mary Beth Leonard, uh, Ambassador to Nigeria. Yes. Uh, great to have you here. Nigerian or Ghanaian Jollof, please. So, you know, one of the very last in-person events that I went to before all, everything shut down with COVID was Ghanaian National Day. And there was a side-by-side -side taste test of Ghanaian and Nigerian. <laughs> oh, no. And um, I am going to decline to tell you which one I prefer. <laughs> Loud and draw what difference you may without validating that inference. <laughs> Bravo. I think she deserves an excellent <laughs> round of for that non-answer answer. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, that's funny. Um, Ambassador, uh, in Nigeria, so much is going on right now, but let's just mm -hmm. focus on um, the economic and investment priorities that you mm -hmm. have in Nigeria. What are they? Well, you know, we have such a, a robust uh, uh, economic relationship with Nigeria. This is, you know, one of the giant, the giant economy on the continent. We're um, one of the most significant um, sources of foreign direct investment. Uh, we're among each other's uh, largest trading partners. Two-way trade in, in 2019 was $7.8 billion. Uh, after, uh, Nigeria is the second biggest destination of U.S. goods coming here. We're their top 10 market. Um, so it's just, a, it's just a privilege to be um, here as an observer and a guider and a supporter of what is already an incredibly significant um, relationship. I think um, in, in 2020, you know, the story here, while COVID might be, you know, uh, feeling like it's taking uh, not so many lives in this unbelievably youthful, confident, uh, unbelievably youthful continent, in Nigeria, of course, the story is also the impact that the world economic slowdown has had on the price of oil. Um, and so for a country that is overwhelmingly dependent on oil revenues in its budget, um, it's caused some serious reflection and some, um, you know, some, uh, uh, put new impetus behind what has long been a stated goal of both the United States and Nigeria, how to more diversify the economy so you're not so uh, concentrated in that one sector. You know, Nigeria very much wants to uh, uh, add value to the products that it has. It wants to become more uh, food um, self-sufficient. It wants to um, expand agriculture. Um, you know, there's a, you heard from some of the previous panels, the, the robust digital economy. Um, these are all things that, that we discuss with the government of Nigeria that we seek to support. Um, we are the host for the um, West Africa Trade Hub that looks at ways in which in regional barriers within the, the reach, barriers to regional trade can be eroded um, away. Um, and it's a, a very interesting interesting time about thinking about how Nigeria can restructure itself uh, to be in a really good position uh, to diversify and grow in a, in a more balanced and broad way when we get to the other side of the COVID-inspired uh, economic crisis. And, and because Nigeria is such a, a large market, robust economy, you know, innovation that comes out of Nigeria is amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Uh, one, one of the entrepreneurs uh, I was listening to earlier today asked this question, and I, I was taking added notes, and I want to pose it to you. Uh, mm -hmm. in Nigeria. What can the U.S. contribute to Africa to make it a digital powerhouse? What, what more mm -hmm. can be done? How, how do you see that role mm -hmm. really developing the digital uh, economy of Africa? Yeah, well, you know, we, uh, the U.S. mission here has really strong ties to both uh, Nigerian and American business communities, and we lay specifically with the American Business Council, which is the local affiliate of the American uh, Business Chamber and the U.S. Nigeria Council. And the former organization actually has sort of sector pillars of which the digital economy is one. So it's a fabulous venue to, uh, to talk about um, how the policy decisions get made that, that lead to a nimble and, and fleet of foot um, uh, 
basis uh, for for digital uh, um, activity. Uh, you know, we're very strong supporters, and we've seen uh, during the, the 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 COVID shutdown how uh, digital banking and the digital platforms were were so were so important and were so available. And so it's a really great uh, launching pad. So it's um, we we meet together with both these organizations, but also sector by sector, so we can sort of figure out um, where our most uh, prized or, or, or important interventions would be to support uh, both Nigerian and American businesses working in right. that field. Right, and, and, and in terms of intervention, there was another theme that came out is mm -hmm. how, how would the US government help advocate uh, safe policy space for startups in particular, mm -hmm. and particularly in tech? Yeah, and you know, and I think it's um, it, it's a it's a really fascinating story about the business climate here um, because I think that uh, there there's there are goals of yes, you want to promote a digital economy, yes, you want to promote uh, value added in agriculture, uh, but you, you need to in 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 holding those cherished goals. I think sometimes there's a there's a bit of magical thinking. You know, uh, have you really chosen the right policy to enable the digital sector? Um, do you need to think a little bit more about phasing if you say you want to have um, value added in agriculture or in dairy or in what it, widget? <laughs> whatever widget you choose, um, that uh, trying to think about um, how to support that without uh, introducing restrictions that in the short term harm consumers and vulnerable uh, populations, because uh, in the, in a, as you're waiting for some, a particular sector to develop, meanwhile, there's a, often a, an increase in prices. So it's a, the, the business community here is really um, uh, very keen to engage with us and the government of Nigeria to think about how you phase that out so that you are protecting most also vulnerable Nigerians who need to buy rice or dairy products or whatever, and getting to the goal of that adding value and, and, and installing industry here. So it's a, it's a very it's a very interesting conversation. And, and just one more briefly, um, mm -hmm. you know, you're navigating the hashtag and SARS protests stuff, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? That's all going on in Nigeria. Then there's COVID yeah. and mm -hmm. then just general economic impact of everything. Um, yeah. On a huge economy so how how are you how are you handling that like in, and mm -hmm. you know keeping things going while navigating something quite profound that is happening mm -hmm. in Nigeria mm -hmm. today? yeah yeah I mean it's uh you know I can I've been my phone has been flashing all day with sort of um, uh, little alerts about protests here and there, although of course, you know, the decision has been taken to, to disband the, the unit in, in question. Um, but it's a, it's, it's a, it's a time to be a, a great accompanier as a, as a partner. Um, uh, certainly on the, you know, starting at the health front, um, uh, you know, we, we've always been a big contributor to health in Nigeria and the, the COVID response of this country basically rests on the billions of dollars that we've built in things like lab infrastructure um, over the years and something like five dozen people who work in my mission are working every day, all day on um, COVID-19 response. Um, and so it's identifying opportunities. It's it's remembering to be in this for the long haul and to, to be in it for how we are positioning ourselves for the after the COVID crisis that you're in a good spot given and all of the dynamics uh, of uncertainty that we're facing. Thank you, Ambassador. Mm -hmm. uh, let's uh, bring Ambassador Lana J. Marks uh, to the stage, South African Ambassador. Uh, great to have you here with us. How's it? Uh, Ambassador, uh, South Africa has taken a beating as the, the country on the continent uh, when it comes to COVID. Um, it's been a really tough uh, scenario to navigate for so many people. Um, from your perspective, uh, how, how, how has that impacted the work that uh, the embassy, uh, the U.S. government is doing, needs to do in, in the largest economy on the continent after Nigeria? Or Thank, almost you that, <laughs> Thank you for that terrific question. And yes, how is it indeed? <laughs> Lekka, <laughs> Lekka. I've been totally up, outnumbered with all you northerners and all your <laughs> items. So thank you for saying something that I'm familiar with. Um, fortunately, South Africa has the largest PEPFAR program in the world. And so we have an incredible infrastructure. It's a, it's a multi-billion dollar program, a $7.4 billion program. Uh, Congress has been very generous to uh, assist South Africa with epidemic control. And because of this infrastructure on the ground, we were able to pivot this entire very significant infrastructure together with the Ministry of Health, Minister McKenzie, who's absolutely phenomenal, to COVID-19. 
obviously, um, it has been a challenge for South Africa because they locked down completely. So yeah. it was uh, a challenge for the economy. I feel also blessed to be ambassador here during the time of President Ramaphosa, who's who's just been absolutely extraordinary. We were also fortunate to supply uh, through this administration 1,000 state-of-the-art, highest technology ventilators to South Africa, even some with the fantastic screens. And this was enormously appreciated by um, by South Africa, they are via made in Ohio, 100%. And South Africa has never had such a product. So mm -hmm. the goodwill engendered because of that has been absolutely extraordinary. We've uh, supplied the oxygen for the ventilators as well. They're portable so they can be taken into the rural areas. Um, and also it's just a matter, you know, I, I arrived here in November and then had to pivot to COVID with the, the online platforms, et cetera, et cetera. And we've just had to pivot and engage accordingly. So that's amazing. So you got there and, and this happened uh, and you were right in it. Um, so, so in terms of recovery, right, because as, as we as South Africa looks to come out of this, uh, what uh, what what uh, uh, what opportunities uh, does the U.S. government, does your embassy have in place in order to help that recovery? Uh, what what should South Africans know? Yes. So first of all, when I came here, I saw that uh, South Africa was our 39th trading partner. It's the number one economy on Africa in trade with the United States. And uh, we're number three of South Africa. Number three is not very good for me. Number one is the only language I understand. So I made it my mission from the time I arrived here that I was going to have intense engagement across all sectors. And also there'd been very little engagement with the ministers in South Africa for the last 20 years. I've engaged one-on-one -on -one with all the ministers, with all sectors. And even though we have a COVID year for now, trade, the exports from South Africa to the United States in 2020 have actually, I've done intense engagement. I've been intense about increasing business and business has increased this year, 44% from last year. We're doing a billion dollars a month exports wow. from South Africa to the United States since I've arrived here. And that's just the starting point. What I've done is I've gone to each minister. For example, I met Minister Mantashe, who nobody had met with for years. And I actually, within three weeks, brought him to the United States to our Department of Energy just prior to COVID. And I said, Minister, what can we do for you? What can the US do for you? And I've gone to each and every minister. I've engaged with them extensively and created um, a very good rapport with very, very significant projects both way in the offing coming up now uh, within the coming year, but very significant. Um, South Africa has really pivoted to the United States. The response has been very positive. Right. Um, the agriculture has been way up, the citrus right. has been way up. And I see this just as a starting point for the future. There are many, many projects in the works. And um, I, I think that um, South Africa is availing itself of the United States as we are assisting uh, with South African companies by USAID, pivoting, um, helping them to also do business with the United States. I think even if COVID mm -hmm. hadn't happened, this was needed. And, uh, and finally, what would you say are the two or three biggest growth sectors for South Africa when it comes to U.S. investment and business opportunities? Uh, I'd say in South Africa or even in, in the region, Southern African region. Right, right. You know, I'm not going to limit it to a particular sector. We have tremendous opportunities with agriculture. We have tremendous opportunities in the mineral sector, advanced manufacturing services. So... Uh, telecom, 5G, we're working intensively on that. I just convened many, many meetings here regarding 5G uh, for the future. And then actually was in Washington several weeks ago and we, conv we convened a very significant meeting, the NSC, with all the stakeholders for 5G. So tremendous opportunity, defense supplies, there's medical supplies, 
I could go on and on. I'm not going to limit it to a particular sector or a particular service. It's absolutely across the board and we're only starting. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. All, all ambassadors uh, really enjoyed your responses. Now, I just have a few more minutes left and I got some questions from uh, various people that had come through. In the interest of time, maybe I could just pick one I like. <laughs> uh, sorry uh, if, if I've missed anyone else out because I think it gives everybody the opportunity to answer it rather than just direct one one and then we'll run out of time. And it's also relevant, okay? So uh, the question is this. It is from Kigale uh, in Rwanda and it's from a finance director in uh, mobile telco sector. And, and uh, the, it's, the question is this, we're talking about international business in a pandemic when travel is difficult, impossible or prohibited. In what ways have your embassies adapted to a digital environment to establish or maintain connections between the US and your host countries? Now I know everyone kind of has touched on this, but we can maybe drill down on one or two points that you further want to make or, or highlight. So perhaps I could start with Ambassador Fight. We have, you know, we've done some really big um, webinars, did one with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in um, Washington, did another one with the BCIU in New York with a number of American companies to let them know what was the situation in Angola, what was continuing to go on. But here, you know, doing, getting in touch with Angolan um, uh, companies, one of the things that we've been doing is we have had uh, webinars here or, or uh, Zoom calls with ministers, with ministries. We've done a lot with um, just kind of the general type of things that we would typically do in a regular period of, of phone calling, of letter writing, um, maybe a little more formal in some regards. And, um, you know, even with COVID, we have found a way to have small meetings, generally outdoors. I think everybody feels a whole lot more comfortable outdoors, wearing our masks and, you know, we can still get together and have a conversation when we need to, because, you know, at the end of the day, the person to person really is very important, but we've got to be safe when we do that. Ambassador Sullivan. Uh, so earlier I mentioned um, we've had a virtual trade mission and we're looking forward to uh, the connections and follow up from that. Um, I, I think, the U.S. is very, um, for U.S. business people, I think it actually gives us an advantage vis-a-vis um, -vis the business relationships um, with different African countries because uh, we're already very comfortable with the virtual world and the teleconferences. And, and I just think in a way it accelerates. Um, the, the only thing that's different is it's kind of a longer day because of the time difference, you know, depending on the time of year, four hours, about to go to five hours. Um, but everybody is energized and continuing to um, do what they would be doing anyway, uh, just in a different way that's frankly more time and cost effective. Thank you. Ambassador Makata. I think uh, we're, we're very fortunate because, uh, and, and thanks to Kenya's vibrant uh, digital ecosystem, they, they were able to adjust quick. Uh, for instance, our, our FTA went to a virtual platform very quickly where we set up an operation to where we could, uh, after we had one challenging call, we shifted to a uh, investing about $200,000 to make sure that we had a way of communicating clearly. I'd say one other big thing that's come out of this too is we have, uh, we're just now launching a way to connect every school in Kenya uh, with, uh, with internet and the K through eight curriculum that is, is actually resident in the school. And, uh, and really that push would not, we would not have, that would not have come about if it wasn't for COVID. And so now uh, every child in Kenya is gonna have an opportunity to learn uh, even through a, another pandemic. So a lot of good things have come from it. Thank you, Ambassador. Ambassador Leonard, what, what are your thoughts? 
Well, you know, I think uh, where, there, where there's a will, there's a way. I mean, this is the way we have to live our lives. And it, uh, think a little bit about the image in your mind of a stereotypical Nigerian entrepreneur and American entrepreneur. And I think that you would say they are kid, kindred spirits. I mean, they're both sort of known as, you know, aggressively entrepreneurial and energetic and busy, busy. And so those people are going to find a way to come together. Um, and, you know, the very many platforms that our, my colleagues have spoken about, we too have, you know, had um, discussions with BCIU, the U.S. Nigeria Business Chamber, the American Business Council, and it's really a fabulous venue for learning about the specific COVID things that we can help fix. Like we had a U.S. Um, hygiene product, uh, products manufacturer who um, was being caught up in the um, the, st the shutdown of state borders early in the in the crisis, and who couldn't get things moved so that you know very important products that, that the population needed to get through this period uh, could be delivered to them. Um, uh, in another case, we had a farm farm manufacturer um, company that made the point that you know if you want to have domestic agriculture and, and production, then probably you need to make it possible for the guy who repairs the tractors to travel across the country in those in those periods. Um, so it's uh, it's uh, we're we're looking all the time at the uh, the how we get this information in, how we use it, and and the, as I said, those those connections are uh, like water finding its level. I think uh, to, to 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 go rushing towards each other. Thanks, Ambassador Um Yes, um, <clears throat> I engaged recently with the Minister of Telecommunications here uh, to discuss the needs of South Africa in the digital arena. We then convened with our commercial services folks here <clears throat> and then with some of our great corporations and institutions in the United States to put this all together and it's going incredibly well. And the second aspect is um, I convened some of our very significant 30 of our largest international corporations uh, like Amazon, GE, etc. And we put together a portal. I got USAID to assist with the IT people. And we put together a portal and the presidency of South Africa is very, very excited about it. And we're gonna make this next week actually live. And it's gonna be available to the presidency, all the ministers, all the premiers of all the provinces in South Africa. And it's going to train free all young South Africans in the digital arena and uh, have opportunities for young South Africans with American companies in the digital arena. So these two examples um, I'm really excited about. Thank you so much. I think we have like time for a quick final thought if uh, anyone is bursting to say anything. Um, I kind of like to wrap it up that way and you leave all of us with a concrete thought, like the one thing you want us to, to take away from all of this. Um, Ambassador Fight, uh, if we could just go back around and, and start with you, just short and tight. And what's the concrete thing I need to know as, as an African business, as an Angolan business, uh, wanting some uh, US help and, and building that relationship and investment? Um, we're here to help you. We're committed to helping companies and we're also committed to working with the government of Angola to improve the business environment here. Ambassador Sullivan. Uh, what she said, but also um, <laughs> patience and persistence go a long way. And I think it's important mm -hmm. to uh, take time to examine the cross-cultural differences. Uh, and when you're pitching your company, don't pitch the way you want to be pitched pitch the way the American companies want to be pitched. And part of that is, what have you done for us lately? Not, um, you know, here's where we were, our friendship, our relationship 20 years ago, 60 years ago. Um, get, try to get inside each other's minds uh, to facilitate that type of um, productive communication. Great, took notes there. Ambassador McCarter. Well, two things. I think uh, those that invest, uh, uh, the quickest can take advantage of a, uh, a, a population of youth that are uh, trained, prepared, ready to go. Uh, they're innovative, they're hardworking, and uh, all they need is some opportunity. Uh, it, and, and to the second thing is uh, make sure to make use, make use of the, the, the talent that we have at our embassy to, uh, to lead you, guide you, put you in the right place, put you with the right people, mm -hmm. and help you. Ambassador Leonard? Yes, I mean, we're absolutely here to help. And, you know, as befits this economic giant and the strong economic ties, we are a uh, a fully articulated um, uh, set of services with both uh, an embassy here in Abuja, and actually I'm in Massachusetts, but our embassy is in Abuja. <laughs> and a consulate in Why you had power for so long? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
so, you know, and we have, you know, uh, economic officers in both places. We have a foreign commercial service presence, uh, the Department of Agriculture, uh, USAID that has Power Africa and the West Africa Trade Hub, Feed the Future, uh, the Trade and Development um, Agency is here, as well as we have a new representative from the, uh, from the new US uh, DFC. So, yes, you can look at the, at the pages and figure out where to send a, um, send a message, but if that's all confusing, you can just send something to direct line Nigeria at state.gov and we will direct it for you. We're here to help. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, and final word, Ambassador Marks. Thanks. This quote from the facade on the Department of Commerce building in DC, and it says, commerce defies every wind, uprights every tempest and invades every zone. I'd like to keep in mind the aptness of that quote, because if you consider any area of life, not just in South Africa, but perhaps in Africa as a whole, they wouldn't be radically altered and improved by the guarantee of a job, by the ability to provide for oneself and one's loved ones. It's the base of the pyramid from which everything else is built. South Africa and Africa is the future with the young population for the United States. Thank you so much. Really appreciate everybody's thoughts and time and insights here. I think it's a really useful conversation. Thank you very much. Let me turn it over now to the summit chair, Teresa Clark, for some closing remarks. Sunday. Well, Zane, first of all, I'd like to thank you for your excellent moderation of this conversation. Of five, <laughs> five significant diplomats. Um, I must say to all of you, as an American who has spent the last 25 years of her life in, in Africa, much of which was in South Africa, I'm especially proud of the way in which you are representing the United States. And I can see that our diplomatic corps is in excellent hands. And I thank you for, for all that you're doing. I would also be remiss if I didn't take this moment to thank um, one person in particular, and that is Nicole Peacock, who is sitting in the Department of State and Head of Comms. And it is through her that we have met all of you, as well as the Assistant Secretary of State. And um, quite frankly, Nicole was the seed that planted this, this thing that became the virtual summit. I spoke with Nicole many months ago about putting something together that might, um, might involve ambassadors, might involve the Assistant um, Secretary of State. And it mushroomed into what became um, this virtual summit today. So thank you, Nicole for the introduction to your colleagues here and for making this happen. Um, as we as I said, you, I think we started this session a couple of minutes past the hour, so you probably heard me say this, so it's not uh, original at this stage of the game, but this is the time that I am supposed to be on stage thanking all of you and shaking your hands and taking an image. Um, but I will, of course, Africa.com will be making a contribution to the Student Sponsorship Program of South Africa, Ambassador Marks. It's a very important organization that spans the U.S. and South Africa. There are a number of significant U.S. institutions um, that have sponsored this organization from its first day. And I hope at some point we'll be able to share more about the organization with you in, uh, personally. Um, but we will be making a contribution to this organization, each of your names as a small token of our appreciation for your sharing your knowledge and expertise with the Africa.com audience. I must also thank the sponsors who have made this day possible. We start with General Electric, Bank of America, and Covington, all of whom have been um, wonderful partners and have helped us to put together the programming today by contributing speakers and um, expanding their networks of relationships to help um, us invite the significant leaders who have all been a part of today's session. Um, I also want to thank our, medium, our media partners. Our platinum medium partners include Africa Investor, The Mail and Guardian, and Ventures Africa. We have a number of other gold media partners across the continent, primarily in the realm of business content for um, digital players who have assisted us in publicizing this event and we'll also be reporting on it after it is over. This has been um, just a fantastic opportunity for African businesses to learn about the resources that the US government makes available. We've closed the day with this session, which I think was a perfect place to do so by bringing it home, making it real, moving from policy to talking about the very specific examples that ambassadors in five key African markets have experienced by telling us specifically the ways in which they have engaged with businesses in their local communities and inviting the business communities to engage with them, their economic officers and their commercial service officers. So with that, I will close today's virtual summit 
And once again, thank this last panel for your very important contribution to this dialogue.